A little bit harder. Very good. Y'all not listening. Go ahead. What's your name? Ready? Here we go. I want y'all to pay attention. It's Matthew. Matt. This is Joe Junior, isn't it? Matthew. Yes, he's Matthew. All right, y'all. Y'all pay attention. Matthew's bringing us to order. Go ahead, man. Do it, hard. Woo! All right, y'all in order. All right, Matthew. See, Matthew, they're applauding you. Good job. Do it one more time. One more time. Real hard. All right, Matthew's the man right there. Good job, Matthew. Thank you so much. All right. We're gonna begin our meeting with, if most of you know, we try to begin every uh, business meeting with recognition of folks who made a difference to our district or for our district. And, um, and sometimes those folks who are making a difference spend their time recognizing other people who've made a difference, who've been successful. Um, Commissioner Hallmark is uh, gonna recognize one of those groups that recognizes students. Is Commissioner Hallmark. So it's my honor to do this recognition of this very special group. I would like to start with a quote by Bayard Rustin. If we desire a society of peace, then we cannot achieve such a society through violence. If we desire a society without discrimination, then we must not discriminate against anyone in the process of building this society. If we desire a society that is democratic, then democracy must become a means as well as an end. I'd like to say that art is a powerful instrument for helping human beings translate important concepts. Through art, Children can digest key ideas more deeply through the act of creating something, and so it is with this initiative. Since 2008, over 2,000 RCSD students have submitted artwork in the Rise Up Rochester poster contest to encourage their peers to promote peace, healing, and justice. Tonight, the board will honor district students for their creativity in inspiring nonviolence in the community. Please join me in welcoming Wanda Ridgeway of Rock the Peace, who will introduce our student winder, winners of the Rise Up Rochester poster contest. Oh, he's going to do a little film. If you can direct your attention the to the billboard film. contest is an opportunity for Rochester City School District students to take a proactive stand against violence, especially homicide. Approaching our eighth year, over 3,000 students have submitted artwork that promotes nonviolence, crime reporting, and making healthy decisions. This week, five billboards were placed in the following locations. Two on Dewey Avenue and Bennington Street, one on Portland Avenue on the corner of Draper Street, another on the corner of Norton and North Clinton Avenue, and lastly on the corner of Hudson Avenue and Cleveland Street. Please continue to support Rise Up Rochester in their efforts to combat violence. Please join Rise Up, a subsidiary of Baber, in our weekly prayer circle. Locations are printed in your bulletin. See Sister Wanda Ridgeway for further information. Thank you. I just want to say it's, it's truly been a blessing. We have been, you know, since 2008, we have um, had hundreds of students who have submitted drawings to um, the contest. This year, we didn't have a great turnout, but next year, we're going to make sure that we get the information out and that the, um, the students, you know, um, because they really enjoy it. But I want to honor three students. One, unfortunately, one of them we just heard moved back to Buffalo, but I'm going to take her award and um, present it to the school, and they will give, get it to her. Um, so the first one, um, the art teacher is here. 
Miss Amy, can you come up? Is for Jakia Strong, and she's a student over at number 16, and her billboard is on the corner of Cleveland and Hudson. And I, I just want to thank you. You have just been a blessing to me. We just email, email, <laughs> send emails, but she's here. And um, what's the lady last name? No, I need Lily because she's got Lily. Oh, no, not Maria. What's her name? What's not her name? Oh, hold on one second. Just a technical error. Caitlin Reeves. <laughs> and that's it. And our last winner was Maria Rivera. Like I said, she's Maria Richardson. She's um, moved to Buffalo, but Vanguard will receive this award on her behalf. Thank you. Come on, you can be more lively, my goodness. I want to thank Baber. Um, you guys have year in and year out come through with this project. There is a song by Ms. Day uh, called Rise Up. It's one of my favorite songs. And this, of course, effort began long before that song became uh, top on the charts. But it's a, if you don't know that song, it's a very powerful song. And it talks about how you can rise up, even in the most difficult set of circumstances. In Rochester, uh, with all of its blessings, has had the burden of violence for many years, and, and uh, as you all know, you've read the headlines as of late, and we have struggled with that. Um, and uh, when I used to work for the city of Rochester for Mayor Bill Johnson, um, at the time Bill Johnson took office, the homicide rate was 71 homicides. And people thought, oh, that's so terrible. Now it gets to 40 and 30, and people are like, oh, that's so terrible. But the reality is, one homicide is a homicide too many. Um, many of my colleagues have worked in this field of servicing people for many years, and not only as servants, but as parents and uh, loved ones of people who we've lost through violence. And so we need to teach our children resilience, and sometimes that resilience comes through creativity. And it is appropriate uh, that I am following Commissioner Hallmark uh, and the folks at Baber to talk about uh, our hometown hero. Now, many of you know we have a number of awards as a Board of Education we, we, we give out. We try to be positive in the light of the, the challenges that this community faces, because if you're just focusing on the negative, um, it can take away the most important element that keeps us going, that is hope. And when we see things, people do things positive, uh, we should recognize that. Um, and sometimes that positivity, com positivity comes through art. Now, you folks know that very well, but uh, we decided uh, as a board that we would begin honoring, we have a lot of awards. We recognize students, we recognize staff members, but we said, well, wait a second, what about honoring those folks who've come through the district and have made us proud and give us hope? Now, today's first hometown hero, that's what we're calling it, we're calling the hometown hero. Can I get an amen for the hometown heroes? That's, come on, y'all need to get a little more excited. We've got some good people coming out of Rochester. That's where our hope lies. And this is the first hometown here we're going to recognize. And for all of you folks out there, listen, the Board of Education wants you to know that if you know of a hometown hero, that is somebody who's come through our district, who is a graduate of our district, who is an alum of our district, we need to raise them up so that other folks can rise up and see what is possible uh, for a district graduate. All right? So, Here's the wonderful coincidence. Today, we were honoring students who use art, uh, and we're going to recognize a hometown hero, Adam Beerton. Adam, did I pronounce your last name right? I couldn't sleep all night being concerned I was going to mess up your name. But listen, he is an artist. I got a script for me here, but he's an artist, a successful artist. Now, check this out. This is, what, this is how I found out about him. 
the brother was on, uh, what was it called, um, the, 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 not the Travel Channel, what was it? Food Network, Food Network. Let's give him a round of applause. The Food Network, that's where I first saw him. Now you're not gonna believe what kind of artist he is. This is so exciting, I, and, th and it's so appropriate. It is almost October. What are most y'all getting ready to do? Pumpkins, pumpkins. This man is no joke. I thought I was doing my thing when I would add a little arm, you know, those plastic arms you put in there, or maybe cut up a nice little face. I thought, Adam, you make me feel bad because this guy is amazing. So without further ado, I want to let you all see what art, true art, looks like. And I also want you to rejoice. Uh, Adam, you got, is this family here? These kids? Oh, man, does your wife? And the kids, I saw a stroller here or there. Let's give them a round of applause because no artist is an artist on his own. I'm sure he's inspired by this wonderful family. But let's take a look at that video, could we? And you guys, uh, guys can see this Adam hometown Hitton, hero. And I am an artist, designer, and builder. <laughs> And now you're going to be that. Uh, I never thought I'd be a pumpkin guy, but I am the pumpkin guy. So I started my uh, schooling at a private school called Our School for Elementary. And I ended up going to Seton, a Catholic school for sixth grade, um, and Siena Catholic Academy for my, uh, middle school. Uh, I spent a year at Bishop Carney and transferred and graduated from School of the Arts. It was the best move I've ever done transferring to a city school. Uh, I went there primarily as a drawer and painter and then I graduated as uh, a 3D sculptor. So it was uh, an invaluable experience. It's literally brought me to where I am today. And, uh, you know, that, that school has literally opened up doors and exposed me to mediums that I otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to. And it's brought me to where I am today. Uh, now with two kids, I have a, a two-year-old daughter and a 10-month, I'm sorry, a 10-week-old son. So I'm really excited to be up here and be able to expose them to the to the Rochester City School District. I'm really excited once once we get settled up here to, to get back involved with uh, with the local art community and the education community. Um, you know, taking a visit back to School of the Arts and seeing some of the teachers uh, is, is something that I've been looking forward to doing uh, and getting involved. To call myself a professional pumpkin carver is nothing uh, I thought I would ever say, but uh, kind of a cool thing. and. Uh, it's been really fun. So for me to get back involved with that community and like maybe be a mentor to some of these kids and show them that anything is possible would be really cool. And I love the fact that, you know, the city school district has like, you know, been so influential to today's community. Like there's so many people that are still here in Rochester, New York, still working to like better this community and doing so many good, exciting things. It's really, uh, it's fun, and I'm excited to be back and be a part of it. So, so when I moved, I moved to Brooklyn, and a few months uh, after living there, my mother sent me an article from the New York Times, and it was of these two professional pumpkin carvers, uh, and they own a company called the Maniac Pumpkin Carvers. Uh, I reached out to these guys, uh, Mark Evan and Chris, uh, and I ended up working a few seasons with them. And both of the owners of that company uh, were on a Food Network show called Halloween Wars. So I was working one season and the production company of that show called Mark and asked him if uh, anybody would be interested to be on the show. So I was like, why not? I'll give it a shot. And uh, they gave me a call and flew me out to LA and we filmed, um, we filmed for I think like three or four weeks. Uh, it was nuts, crazy hours, but essentially Halloween Wars is um, you're teamed up. So I'm a pumpkin carver and I was teamed up with a cake artist and a sugar artist. And uh, the challenge is, is to create these like horrific Halloween displays. And uh, I've never worked with other artists or especially those two mediums, but to combine those three was a new challenge and it was, it was really fun. What I learned from, from being involved in, in something like that was you know, how to, how to be a team player and to uh, combine my artistic ability into like, you know, these like quick fire challenges, like you never know what's coming. And uh, my team went, went on to actually win the show and we won $50,000. I got asked to come back for a spinoff show uh, called Halloween Wars Hayride of Horror, which aired last October. 
um, and I was paired up with, again, more pumpkin carvers and cake and candy artists, and, uh, and we did well on that one as well, so it was, it was really exciting. If I was to say anything to current students, uh, it would be to dream big and, like, don't let anybody get in your way or, like, you know, get caught up in what everybody thinks you should do or what they want to do. You know, you should really be yourself, be an individual, and, and chase the stars, you know. All right, I want you all to join me and give a rounding sound of applause for our uh, artist, father, and hometown hero, so School of the Arts graduate, Adam Beerton. Come on, give him a round of applause. Come on, Adam. Come on, come on, bring your family up here. Come on, Adam, I got something I want to give you. Bring your family up here, too. Come on, if you can. Come on, uh, wife. Yeah, yeah, they deserve Bring it. Bring the whole family up, because we're going to want to take pictures. Oh, gee, sweet. All right. Let's give him another round of applause. This is a certificate that says the Rochester Board of Education is a certificate of rec recognition, is hereby awarded to Adam Beerton in recognition of being named a hometown, I should tell you, the first hometown hero this day, September 25th, 2018. Congratulations. Wow. Can I ask one thing, Adam? What's the, what's the name of your show? So I can, I mean, the the clip, so I can Google it and watch what you did. Uh, uh, Halloween Wars on Food Network. We're on okay. on season five. Okay. And we are the Scream team. Thanks. Yeah. Um, first of all, th thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. This is uh, uh, an incredible honor. I, you know, if you told me 20 years ago in, in School of the Arts that I'd, you know, uh, be where I am today, I probably wouldn't believe you. Um, <laughs> And I probably don't deserve this. There's been so many people uh, in my life that have been a guiding force to my success. Um, my beautiful wife uh, is one of them. She supports me through all my crazy endeavors. Uh, you know, all the teachers in the Rochester City School District that are making a difference in kids' lives every day, they're the real heroes. Um, the Rochester City School District and itself providing me with uh, opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So I just want to say thank you, and uh, I'm going to dedicate this to uh, my two beautiful kids. So right. thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Again, let me repeat, as everybody finds their ways to their seat, uh, if you know of a hometown hero, someone who graduated from our district, who is making us proud and making a difference, uh, can I, can I, it's called 262-8525. 262-8525. You don't have to be on TV. The person doesn't have to be famous. Uh, but you have to be making a difference. So we, we anxiously await our ne next opportunity to give a hometown hero award. All right. Uh, Will? Thank you, Van. I'm glad to see the room filling up because I'd love to see more people um, bear witness to this next recognition. Uh, GC, you want to come up? Uh, Gian, uh, Giancarlo Giannini, or GC, is a parent of um, how many kids? Two kids. They went to school 23 and then to Soda. So he and I have been following each other through history for a very long time, and he has been serving as my parent liaison on the board's finance committee for a, a lot of years. I, I didn't actually tally the years, but and I don't know if you did. 
but um, quite a few, <laughs> since 2011, actually. So this will be his seventh year. Um, and um, his children have finally graduated this past uh, May, and we thought because of the longevity of his service um, to the Parent um, Advisory Committee, PAC, and to, as liaison to the board's finance committee, that it was appropriate to recognize him. He's been tirelessly devoted to um, both PAC and to the finance committee, attending uh, as, as faithfully as any board member uh, since 2011. He's been he diligently sifted through our financial reports, resolutions, proposed budgets for those last seven years. GC's incisive inquiry and analyses has been instrumental to the board's oversight of board finances and to the budget deliberation process. Through his service on PAC, he has played a pivotal role in informing parents of important issues and developments, not only speaking for them um, to the committee, but also reporting back to the parent organization. Um, and. Um, bringing, representing parents' concerns uh, and perspectives to the board and to the administration. So please join me in a recognizing GC. His certificate reads, presented by the Board of Education and Superintendent of Schools for your commitment to serving families and the community as a member of the Parent Advisory Council and parent representative to the board's finance committee given this day, 25th day of September, 2018. Please. You know, I, I never tried to say GC's full name, and I'm not even going to try today, but there are words that are a lot simpler for me, like thank you and uh, Gracias. Uh, we appreciate your work. And as Willis said, he literally is here uh, as frequently as any board member. And uh, he's not just filling up a seat. He frequently and regularly is participating, asking critical questions. I'm sure there's been a staff member and a board member or two who's been somewhat annoyed by his persistence, but it's good persistence. We're very thankful. And, and uh, on behalf of the board, I'm looking you straight in the eye and I'm saying thank you. Can't say your name, but I can say thank you and mean it. So thank you very much for your service. All right, um, we're at the top of our meeting, and so we begin with the, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Adam, uh, since you are a dis you see, always ready to serve, Adam Beard. Adam, is your daughter, dis can you help her uh, help us do the Pledge of Allegiance? You think you could help us out? Oh boy, yeah, man, that's, that's what you get. You, you're going to owe us now. We gave you an award. You got to... Uh, we begin each uh, thing with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you want to come on down and there's a mic? What's, her, what's your daughter's name? My daughter, Kaya. Kaya, okay. Hi, Kaya. Hi. You can take that mic over there and we're just going to do the... What's that? Well, we are, we're going to help you out. We're going to do it together. We're going to do it together. All right. All right, here we go. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks again, Adam, for serving. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just say, uh, as Adam is taking a seat back with his daughter, we should uh, also thank our communications department, um, Tom, Thomas, uh, I know you uh, and others uh, work really hard, and I, I don't get everybody's name, I apologize. You will thank everybody for those wonderful um, hometown hero videos. We appreciate that. Um, keep, we'll keep them coming. Again, let me repeat, anybody who has a hometown hero, someone who graduated from our district, please call 262-8525. All right. Uh, I would also remind folks that we do recognize people who are in our district. We uh, last two year, two three years ago, we began a, an award uh, called Yes We Can that recognized whole schools for accomplishments. These schools don't necessarily have to be top performing schools, but schools that have made progress. 
we recognize them. You'll see some of the people, uh, the photographs of some of those schools on the front there, we recognize them. Um, we also recognize individuals within our district and the I Believe Award. We started that too a couple years ago. And that recognizes, this is how that award system works. You recognize a student who is doing well, who's performing well. The school identifies that student. That student gets the award. But before that student comes here on a Thursday night to receive his award, he or she has to identify a teacher, a cafeteria lady, a custodian, a paraprofessional who believed in them. So that night, Thursday night, the board not only recognized the student, but the student gets to introduce the adult who believed in them. So if anybody has any nominee in that regard, please call 262-8525. We would appreciate your ideas and suggestions. All right, I need a motion to approve the August 23rd business meeting of minutes. Is there a motion? And moved by Vice President Powell, Second. seconded by Commissioner Hallmark. Uh, no objection, those minutes are approved. We also have uh, minutes from the September 13th Charter School uh, hearing uh, uh, regarding the Academy of Health Science Charter Schools and Boys to Men Charter School. And I also need a motion, and that same motion, to approve the September the 18th special meeting minutes. Is there a motion? Been moved by Commissioner Funches, seconded by Second. Commissioner Hallmark. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Yes. Could you just uh, note that here? Um, Shanae, um, that on the last line in the uh, committee charter school reports, um, can you please reflect it to say Commissioner Weiss as Commissioner Evans? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you for catch thank, you. thank you for catching that. Uh, all right, so now we're on that portion of the agenda where we recognize, uh, give people an opportunity to speak. I should tell you all, as you watch this, it may seem kind of odd because somebody is going to take that podium, I promise you, and they're going to have a concern about our district, some problem. Now, you're not going to see any of us really respond. And, and the reason why we do that is not because we don't care, not because there is not an answer, but because we, this is the people's opportunity to speak up. So everybody gets three minutes. Uh, you'll, see an obno you'll hear an obnoxious bell or buzzer begin to ring. I would ask that you respect the bell because what you're doing when you respect the bell, you're respecting other people who have yet to speak. On occasion, you guys probably watch this on TV and you have people that go beyond their three minutes. And I'll sometimes tell them, sometimes not so politely, sir, ma'am, please finish, please don't put me in a situation where I have to do that. I don't like doing it, but I'll do it if I have to. But don't make me do that because what you're doing is you're not hurting me, you're hurting the next person who's waiting to speak. All right, so let's begin with Mary Lupian. Mary Lupian. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, hi, my name is Mary Lupian. Um, good, good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Um, my children go to School 53, Montessori Academy, um, which uh, Montessori is the education mechanism that closely, respect, uh, closely resembles, most closely resembles my husband and I philosophy for how you should educate children. And we love it there. Um, over the past couple of years, we've seen some changes that are concerning to me. So I just wanted to um, kind of bring those to the board's attention and hope that you look into them. So um, some things I've noticed uh, that make me concerned are this year there's some classrooms that are not at capacity, yet we know that there are many parents that have kids on the waiting list and we're wondering why that is. Um, you know, I know that there's uh, some financial uh, Implications that that wouldn't be a very good idea to leave lots of seats unfilled in many classrooms. Um, there have been some teaching positions that have gone unfilled, um, and uh, we'd like to see those filled, like the ESSEL position. Um, and also, uh, the instructional approach there's a brochure that says that the Montessori um, curriculum is instituted in all of the classrooms, um, but there's a new approach that's just recently been rolled out um, called departmentalization, which actually takes the kids out of the classroom from grades three, three through six through, uh, for, uh, for um, ELA and for math. Um, and that goes against the Montessori philosophy. Um, so these things that are going on, um, I just want to be reassured that 
the Montessori approach is valued by the board and by, um, by the people at the school so that that will continue. Because um, I really do believe that the Montessori is a gem in our district, and especially when we're fighting off lots of charter schools, this is one, um, one type of education mechanism that a lot of parents that might choose a charter school would pick. Um, and so I really want to see that preserved. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dinah Gino Vanelli. I usually do mask. I, 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 all right. Help me out here to so say it correctly. Dina. Dina. Gino Vanelli. Vanelli. Joe. Joe Vanelli. Joe Vanelli. Vanelli. Got it. You um, give it to Gina, why don't you give it to her? Yeah, and then, all of them? Yep. Yes. And she'll, okay. she'll make yes, sure we get this. Well, you sure can. <laughs> So I um, actually have some uh, supportive documentation given that I only have three minutes to speak tonight. Um, my name is Dina Giovanelli. Um, I am currently the urban sociologist at MCC. Um, I am a Montessori parent going into my sixth year. And some things that really concern me both personally and professionally are educational inequality, um, institutional racism in all of our institutions. And I'd like to talk about some concerns that I have this evening about some things that I've been noticing over the last couple of years. I do not judge any leader, any person um, uh, with, uh, by comparing them to someone else. And so the fact that our prior principal did things differently is not reason for me to be here today. I feel that um, each individual person should be judged by their own performance. And so um, as we've had a bit of time to look at Dr. Harris Pappen's leadership in our school, I'd like to speak to some key things. Um, I have included for you the principal's um, article 33, page 66 of their contract. Um, and I've included on the page um, after that some of the documentable deficiencies I see in each of the areas of um, evaluation. And this concerns me greatly. Um, but the most important um, issue that I see in leadership is lack of communication. Um, there have been many changes made. Um, Mary spoke to the departmentalization. We currently have a meeting set um, right after our PTA meeting on October 11th. At that point, our children will have been receiving departmentalization education for an entire month before parents are allowed to ask a single question. I take serious, serious issue with that. I asked for data to support this as a best practice, and I asked for the link to Montessori, and I don't think that this is a tall order. Um, the Montessori program changes that also um, have been instituted that are much more minor are things like taking children out of the classrooms to have breakfast and putting them all in a cafeteria. Montessori teaches you life skills, cleaning up and um, looking after one another. Those things are no longer happening. Um, I would like to say that I've included the current enrollment data in this 35-page document that I've saddled you with. And the enrollment data that concerns me is that we're currently listed on the Rochester City website as having higher enrollment than last year. I'm sorry. There's no way that that's possible. The website for the Montessori Academy lists us as having 299 students which is an increase of more than a dozen students from last year. But in walking around in our halls and looking at our classrooms, we have classrooms intended to hold 18 students that have 12. So I'm deeply concerned about this enrollment issue. Um, I'm also deeply concerned about how long our waiting list is. I can say that when I received word that my child was enrolled in the Montessori Academy, I cried. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Bain, Matthew Bain. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I, um, I didn't really prepare anything because I, I thought it was important that we take more of a, um, a higher level uh, vantage of, of what's happening with our schools, not only with this Montessori School 3053, but uh, also with the school district as a whole. Uh, communication seems to be breaking down on a number of levels. And one of the challenges that, um, that uh, Ms. Uh, I don't know your last name, but Ms. Dina, she mentioned 
that uh, communication is an issue. I totally agree, and I want to remind folks in the room as well as the panel here that um, we were spoken to by by Commissioner Commissioner White regarding the proper communication channels. If you have any concerns within the uh, your student's classroom, you need to speak to the to the uh, teacher. If you can't get the answer that you're looking for from the teacher, you need to speak to the parent liaison in the building. Clearly. If you can't speak to the parent liaison and get the answers that you're looking for, you need to speak to the school administration. Uh, if you can't get the answers there, we go on to, correct me if I'm wrong, but we go on to the, to the chief. If not the chief, <laughs> then we go to the, the deputy superintendent. Well, if got, not the deputy right? superintendent, then the superintendent. If you can't get answers even at that point, then that's when you bring it here. The challenge that we're running into is that folks have concerns that they don't, they don't follow the proper protocol to voice their concerns. Uh, whether they're valid or not, I'm not here to argue that, but we need to follow the appropriate steps to be heard. It's, it's out of order when you go, we've actually had uh, parents create a, uh, an ancillary group outside of the PTA. The PTA is actually here to support our school, our administration, our, for the sake of our children. My son goes to Montessori School number 53. We're we're tasked with being advocates for our school as well as our students. And if we don't take the proper steps to begin with, then we're not going to end correctly. Thank you. Ms. Monroe Sims. Ms. I too have some documentation. Keeping in mind that any subject that you have on the table, you can provide documentation that is in support of it and that is not in support of it. So I provided you with documentation that is in support of departmentalization that is happening in Montessori. My name is Walida Monroe Sims. Um, my profession, I have a master in psychology with a concentration in behavior health, but that's what I do professionally. Um, first and foremost, I am a parent of a young man that attends Montessori Academy. He's in the sixth grade. I think what's most important for me as a parent, and I'm on a school-based planning team um, also, and inside those red folders, the folders are red because those are the color of folders that comes home to us. Um, also inside those folders are documentation of the communication efforts that have been made on administration at Montessori. So we've known about the departmentalization. I'm not sure if they have opened up those folders, but though in those folders you will see the documentation that have been sent out to the parents. Each teacher was given that, and that teacher was charged to send that information out. Now, if there was an issue, then you should have maybe followed up with the teacher, and as Mr. Bain said, move forward. But I want to bring light to something that is really most important in regards to Montessori. What is very important for us to understand as parents of students in Montessori, 53 Montessori is a Montessori school in a public school system. It is not a curriculum. It is a framework. Dr. Harris Pappin, when she first came to Montessori, provided parents with the alignment of Common Core in Montessori. That is very important for me because after my son graduates from the sixth grade, he will be going into a public school system. So I want to know how administration is going to align Montessori with Common Core. Everyone, many parents at Montessori have the eye on the prize of schools or arts. Well, I have a child who graduated from SOTA, Common Core, ELA. So in your folders, I also provided you with our test scores. Many parents at Montessori are not focusing on what is very serious there. What is serious is the achievement of our students. Now, Dr. Harris Pappin, she came in, we have, I have in there, if you see, we have the test scores from 2015-16, ELA from 2016-17, and current. I'm not able to provide you with the current actual percentages because those test scores don't come out until Thursday. But I can tell you that they increased. That's the issue here. 
We are also dealing with a percentage of students that are 77% Title I population students. That means there are 77% students in that building who are receiving free and reduced lunch. 65% of those students are black and Hispanic students. Now, what I have experienced as a parent at the Montessori Academy, that there has not been a lot of inclusiveness in parent group or with teachers. So I'm just asking the board today that you take the time, look at the test results, and I promise you that we should revisit this conversation and anything that you have against administration should be brought back to the table and apologize because test scores have increased phenomenally since Dr. Harris Pappin has been in that role. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Monroe Sims, there weren't enough packets to go around. If, if you could, uh, there's at least we can, we can make some more copies, don't worry okay. about it. We'll, we'll make more copies. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll make sure there's more packets. You can make copies, okay. right? Yep. All right, uh, Ms. Kane Oriel, probably got that wrong. No? Tara Kane Oriel. Now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, for the first time Malik Jaff, who is, is did I get that right? Malik. Malik Jaff, uh, who is a student, a senior, right? Senior. At School Without, without Walls. Without walls. Um, he is our, our student, let's give him a round of applause, welcome him to his first uh, board meeting. So what we ask our board reps is to give us a report, let us know what's going on, and also typically board, uh, the young board members will give us an advisory vote on each vote that we take. Now, sometimes they're not able to stick around because their most important priority is to get the schoolwork done. Uh, and I think you're going to leave a little bit early today. Probably. But uh, we're looking forward to hearing your report. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, introduction my name is Malik Jaff. I am a senior at School Without Walls this year and the new student representative for the Rochester City School District's Board of Education this school year. I have been a member of the Student Leadership Congress for the past three years. I am the site coordinator for the GIS Scholars, Inc., where I'm responsible for student recruitment on the, on the School Without Walls campus and also the instructor for the education program at School Without Walls. And my future goal is to attend the Rochester's Institute of Technology, where I would like to major in packaging sciences. So our first meeting this year is going to be Wednesday, September 26th from 3.30 to 5. On the agenda for the meeting, we will discuss recruitment for the Student Leadership Congress, upcoming appointments for the school year, such as the race summits and Rochester City School District student summits, and possible trips. As a part of our recruitment efforts, a group of members from this year's SLC worked on the flyers and brochures for this upcoming year. This is because we would like to have at least one student representative on the Congress from each RCSD high school this upcoming year. We have finalized and adopted a new logo for the Student Leadership Congress that we will share with you at the next meeting. The new logo will appear on all our student recruitment documents and is teenager friendly, which will hopefully attract fellow students into wanting to learn more about the Student Leadership Congress. Steve Lamour also sent out a request to all the principals in the district to inform them that we need the names of the student representatives from, this school, from their schools by October 5th, 2018. Thank you. Good job. Good job. I see some proud face out there. Nice job. Um, next uh, on our agenda, we usually have the uh, Parent Advisory Council and the Bilingual Education Council report. Um, our clerk tells us that uh, okay. they did not provide a written report today. I'm sorry. But I do have an update for the Bilingual Parent Council. So the president's currently hospitalized. So oh, she okay. did call me today. Um, so in their next month's report, because they did have a meeting this month, and I was there, and Dr. Cecilia Golden was there, um, Dr. Ray G was there as well, um, but they will do a modified report sure. for this month and next month. But that's why she doesn't have a report. She wants everybody to know. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner LeBron. Um, in addition, I'm anticipating that the Parent Advisory Council is probably just ramping up. Uh, this is the beginning of the school year, so I'm sure um, uh, the, st the uh, parent reps that uh, provide leadership for that organization will give us a report next month as well. All right, so uh, next we'll move on to superintendent reports. Uh, superintendent Dean Williams, Barbara. That's fun. All right, thank you. 
Thank you. So I just want to report this month on a couple of critical areas. We're gonna talk specifically about enrollment, attendance, projected August graduation, some receivership monitoring updates, and also the facilities modernization plan phase three. I want to start by talking about the operations team. They continue to monitor enrollment on a daily basis. The current enrollment in K-12, as you can see, is 26,313 students. As a comparison, last year we were at 26,058, so we have an increase as of today of 255 students, which is about 97.4% of our predicted enrollment rate. We continue to ensure that we have the accurate counts and we'll continue to do that up through Beds Day. Our executive team, Office of Attendance and Schools have been actively monitoring daily attendance looking at potential chronic absenteeism. Again, deploying teams to meet with parents and visit homes. For 18-19, the average daily attendance to date is 87.4%, and in kindergarten through sixth grade is 90%, and we will continue to focus on our Every Minute Matters campaign. And in addition to ensure that improved attendance and safety continues to be a focus, we have 24 homeschool assistants to support the daily attendance, uh, to decrease chronic absenteeism, and ensure that our robo and personal calls are going out to families that's monitored on a daily basis by school chiefs. I want to congratulate once again the 183 students who completed summer school and graduated from uh, the Rochester City Schools at the end of last month. The 183 young people made a decision to persist in school and earn that diploma. These are 183 students that had individual reasons and life situations that did not allow them to graduate until June, but they did persist throughout the summer and walk across the stage. It was a proud moment. I wanna thank the commissioners, families, and community who were there. One of the things this year was that that uh, group of potential August graduates were all on the Franklin campus. Having one campus allowed the homeschool principals to visit on a regular basis and to monitor and support their students. They wanted to model that knowing every student by face and name and having personal coaching and support needed to achieve can make a difference in the numbers of students that walk across the stage. Some of the things that were done this year is students had weekly two-hour reviews with intervention teams that consisted of assistant principals, counselors, and social workers, as well as homeschool assistants. Each of these teams had concise plans that were designed with the students that had specific support. And I, so I want to thank the teachers and the counselors, parents, and students who worked really hard with that kind of personalized and customized approach. The, I want to report that the preliminary data for the 2014 cohort, including graduates in August, is projected at 59.3%. Uh, there's been a total growth in August graduation over the past three years of 8%, and it takes families, the community, and all the schools working together to make sure that our students succeed. So I want to acknowledge everyone who continues the commitment. We know that this is not enough, that we need to continue to do better and to support higher levels of graduation, but want to recognize the efforts that are put forth and know that we have begun with the 2015 cohort. Every student has been reviewed by their principal and chief and school teams, and we're making sure that those students have the same types of customized plans and personalized approaches. As you know, we're actively supporting all of our schools that are in receivership. These include Nathaniel Rochester Community School, number three, Clemente, eight, Martin Luther King, uh, nine, 17, 45, Monroe, uh, East High School, lower and upper. Every one of these schools have incredibly rich and deep plans in place. They are routinely and regularly monitored and interventions are adjusted to ensure that schools meet their metrics. Our Assistant Commissioner Wilkins from the State Ed Department and her team will be here in Rochester on October 2nd and 3rd. They'll be doing personal site visits and we of course will be with them. The Commissioner will use all of the data within the demonstrable improvement indicators to make decisions about our schools. The State Education Department will notify us of preliminary information by October 19th and we will make sure that our staff and leaders 
are notified when we are able to officially release data, which is expected to be on October 24th. We're going to be submitting all of the required uh, appeals or forms. We have reason to be very hopeful that we're seeing the kind of progress that we need and that some additional data that will be released uh, as early as tomorrow will provide that last bit of information that we need. We should be hearing of final determinations by November 28th. I want to move on to some very, very positive news. We have many reasons to celebrate this school year. We've opened five remodeled state-of-the-art schools through our partnership with the Rochester Schools Modernization Program. And I think everyone knows Monroe School Without Walls, School 16, 15, and 7. And in addition, we have opened our new RISE School, Community School 106. Equally as important, our own Bilingual Language and Literacy Academy has been opened as well. So we want to thank Abel Perez, Program Director David Polonia, Mirna Gonzalez, President of the Bilingual Council, the Latino Task Force, and our Commissioners of Education, uh, as well as Mike Schmidt and his entire team, and the parents in the community who have put a lot of hard work in place to make that program come to life. And it's great to see that kind of energy and enthusiasm around supporting all students in the district. We have seen great work through the Facilities Modernization Program, and we're very, very excited to host upcoming community forums. We want to invite community members to the town hall meetings. There are cards, I think, in front of each of our commissioners so that you know that the dates uh, that we will be asking for folks to come out and provide input into the next phase. And we want to make sure that we have lots of enthusiastic uh, participation on the forums on October 1st at Monroe Auditorium, the 22nd at the Franklin Auditorium, and November 19th at the Jefferson Auditorium. And they're all scheduled from 6 to 7.30. These are for the strategic planning of phase three of the FMP. It's well underway. We know that our students can be experts about learning and about changes. Last year we included them in the Path Forward teams and we will be having special forums for students this year as well to get their, their input into curriculum and school facilities. So we look forward to that. I also want to welcome Malik Jaff, the student representative here on the Board of Education. He's a senior at School Without Walls. And I'm excited for the passion and motivation I know he's going to bring to his new role. His principal, Coretta Bridges, says that he's an awesome and stellar student, great leader. Um, and he's in charge of the school's GIS program. And he assists other students on how to use the GIS mapping system that help pinpoint locations for community service projects. So that's pretty cool. We might be able to have him help us with some projects in the district. Um, I've heard from your principal and your teachers that you're a very personable a role model and that you have plans to follow your sisters, really, to RIT. So I want to congratulate you and welcome you. We're really, really glad to have you be part of our team. You. You're welcome. I want to congratulate a couple of our staff members. It's important that we recognize um, employees that really go above and beyond, and one of those is our Chief Information Officer, Anne-Marie Lehner. She's been selected to serve on, and this is really exciting, Microsoft's K-12 Advisory Board. They have 30 members from across the United States that represent large and small districts, and they gain insights from leaders in the K-12 and higher ed communities to influence Microsoft's products and services um, with a goal to empower students and educators to achieve more. So she's going to serve on that board for at least a year and she'll be working within the education community, fostering those relationships, and certainly bringing the Rochester voice to that table. So we thank her for um, her leadership of our digital transformation project here in Rochester. I also want to acknowledge our own Anidia Padilla Rodriguez. Uh, she was recently honored with the Hall of Heritage Award from her alma mater, SUNY Brockport. And this is the uh, alumni award that is most pres prestigious in Brockport. Um, and she was recognized because all of her distinguished contributions and all of us that work with Nidia um, know that she's a true champion across the city, um, but certainly a true champion for us in Rochester City School District and serves the district and the students and the families tirelessly. She's been with our district 24 years 
We can't go to a meeting without recognizing her contributions, her great ideas, and her just incredible positive energy that she brings day to day. So we want to thank her for her contributions. And I thank you for the opportunity to um, present the great things that are going on in Rochester City Schools. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Sean, Dr. Nelms, oh, you're up. Can I, can I oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. Any Hold questions? on one second, Sean. Any questions or comments for yes. uh, Barbara? Um, Sorry, Sean. I just would like clarification on how we got a 59.30% graduation rate. I was trying to understand what's in combination of like what the total graduation rate actually is. And I wanted to ask if that is including the East High School students. Um, but I'll start there. So the 59.3% for August does include all of the district schools, including East, yes. Okay, could we get a number without East High School? I want Certainly. some data separate. Because mm -hmm. they presented on their graduation rate at the last board meeting. We can get you a, um, a separate count as well as each individual school in the district, certainly. Okay, that's it, actually. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on that particular score, I just, and I know, Commissioner LeBron, you weren't suggesting this, but I know there's this false impression out there that East High School is not a part of the Rochester School District. And I just want to be clear. In case there's any mistake out there, their graduation rate is our graduation rate. It's just like soda it's, that it's traditionally had a high school, high graduation rate. It's just like school without walls. It is our district. These are our employees. The, the, the collective bargaining agreement that's in place is a collective bargaining agreement between the Board of Education and uh, the collective bargaining units in that school, not the U of R. So if we should open up another school and it generates positive or significant increases in the graduation rate. We own that just like we own the graduation rate increases. This is a part of the Rochester City School District. And I know you're not saying this, Commissioner. I'm going to say, man. But, but, but let me finish. <laughs> I have the floor. I just, because I, I know, because I've heard it before. Dr. Nelms has heard it before. And I get concerned about that because we need to own, not only legally are they part of the district, but we need to own our successes. Right? And if we start coming up with some rationale while they're apart from us, we won't own them. This is something that the Rochester City School District, specifically the Board of Education, uh, uh, cheerleaded. And what resulted is a new school opening up that is run and operated by an employee and employees of the district. Dr. Nelms is an employee of the Rochester City School District. Right? I just want folks to understand that. It, because you need to understand that because we might be so adventurous, so bold as to open up another school. No, On our own or with another <laughs> school, we don't know what's going to happen. And I just want folks to know, that. just like soda, and we embellish and we embrace the success of soda and School Without Walls. And we should be embracing the success of schools like they've made improvements like at Edison. Right? We own all of that. Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, we own all of that. We own our failures, and we have to talk about them, but we also must celebrate our successes. Because without that kind of hope, where will our people be? This is our district. That is our school. Those are our people. Uh, Vice President Powell. Um, different topic. Yes, um, ma'am. We did, did hear. You yeah, I'm follow up on you, ma'am. We did hear from some uh, some concerns about Montessori, and I had heard, I had received a phone call, um, passing on the rumor that it was closing, which of course, I mean, I don't know how rumors like that start. I just, I, I can't even fathom it because there's n not been any discussion of such a thing anywhere at this level, uh, nor has the superintendent even hinted that, that such conversations were happening at lower levels. Um, can you just speak to that, uh, that concern for us and just put that rumor to bed? Absolutely. The Montessori program was one of the programs that was uh, distinguished in the path forward as one of the models that would be open for replication. Um, we ensured that the um, professional learning and the coaching and support to that school um, was, was what it needed to be. Clearly tonight we're hearing that we have an opportunity to revisit that, to look critically 
I deeply appreciate those that came forward with information that is specific um, and that we'll be able to look into and you should expect to hear um, from both myself and our chief of schools who's not able to be here tonight, um, but absolutely not Vice President Paul. We are deeply, um, deeply interested in maintaining and expanding our Montessori program. Thank you. Commissioner LeBron. So I just want to follow up that I, all the schools you mentioned do not have a separate superintendent. And I do think it's important that we understand where graduation rates are for the two districts that are under one. We have two superintendents, one district. I understand that. But I don't want to see East, is, East already came in and did a presentation on their data and their graduation rates. I would like to see with our district, aside from East, even though I know you guys are part of this district, where our graduation rates truly are. When we merge the data this way, it doesn't give a clear picture of where our other high school students are at. Um, and if East's success is bumping up the overall district success, it, that's important to know the nitty gritty. I uh, also want to just go back to the data on Montessori. So two different parents came and presented data to us on the Montessori attendant, uh, enrollment. And one packet said 311, the other one from the district said 299, and then a parent also testified that in those data, like 299 couldn't even be correct, that there were even less students physically in the school. So I just want some clarification on the actual enrollment at Montessori for the question log for follow-up. Thank you. Do I have someone on our team that wants to address that now? Or do you want to address it in the question log? It's fine to address in the question log. If you want. You ain't gonna let know about the top any of these? SPA reflects active uh, enrollment at 2.30 today. Yeah. Okay. okay, can I we can get I that fixed on the website? Because they pulled that from the Rochester Did City School District website. One parent did. The other parent, though, presented data. I don't know where she got that data from. It says 311. Mm -hmm. I'd like to also add a question around this same subject to the question log to find out for the last three years, what has been the enrollment year over year? Because one of the things that is fueling the, what the parents' concern is, is that the school seems to have a waiting list and be under-enrolled at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I want to find out what the enrollment has been year over year by grade. Uh, yep. Let me um, just add in this conversation about East and, and make, make sure the point is understood. Because this is critical because, again, this district might decide, and I've advocated to my colleagues and to the superintendent, that we might consider opening up additional schools. Anybody who's known me has known that I've talked about this for several years. Uh, and it's important to understand that just because the model is different doesn't mean you have a different district. Commissioner LeBron, you use phrases like two districts, our district. I, I can't say enough. They are our district. Legally, uh, and in every way substantially, they are our district. Your example that they have a separate superintendent is no different than how the School of the Arts has a totally different structure. It's an audition type school. None of our other schools operate in that way, but we don't extract soda from our numbers. They have a different structure, a totally different structure. None of our schools, I don't think we have any other school where you get to audition. But yet, and they're very successful. Their graduation rate is historically like 89, 90%. We don't extract their numbers. We have schools that have two, three, four APs, and schools that don't have that many APs, right? We have uh, school, the, uh, school Without Walls is what we call a consortium school. None of our other schools in this district have that model approach. Do you know those students at School Without, uh, school without Walls only have to take one Regents exam? But, and their graduation rate is probably in the 80, 90%. We don't extract their numbers. And as this superintendent has pointed out, we have schools that get more money than other schools. And it's, it's, it's a shame. It's a, it's a failure of equity. But we don't extract their numbers from our numbers. People need to understand, this is our school. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Not only legally is that true, but again, we need to understand psychologically, we're at a point where we can identify numerous failures in this district, and we all own them, and we talk about them at length, ad nauseum, because we should. 
But when we get a school that's successful, that is our school financially, legally, we pay the bills for that school. Don't nobody else pay the bills for it. You and I don't pay the bills for that school. When we get a success, what's the first thing we do? We say, oh, that's not our school. That's somebody else's school. They got an extra superintendent. If we're going to be successful as a people, we have to own our failures and our successes. And that, my friends, is a success. Uh, Dr. Nelms. I just want to add, though, Van, again, we have two superintendents. So you're mentioning schools that do not have a separate superintendent who already came here last month and presented a major increase in their graduation rates, and we all gave them kudos. I still would like to know what our district what the other high schools, excluding East High School's graduation rate is. I don't think that that's too much to ask for. And every school that you mentioned, I don't care if they have a different model, they don't have an individual superintendent apart from ours. I just want to put that on the record. If, if you think- And I still would like that question in the question log that I would like the data for the districts and remove East High School graduation rate, which has already been presented. Thank you. Uh, uh Commissioner LeBron, Commissioner LeBron, let me be clear about something. Nothing I said, hold on, nothing I said should be construed, and I don't think anybody in here thought that. Nothing I said would suggest that you are not entitled to get the, that number. You absolutely are. And I, I think that's the, the, the science of understanding where our growth is, where we could have improvement is absolutely critical. I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't have any objection to that. But no offense, Dr. Nelms, but let me tell you something. He is not Superman. This man is not the person responsible for turning that school around. If you think that East High School is successful, and I'm saying it right in front of his face, I'm looking him dead in the eye, he has no cape, he's not bulletproof, he's not turning that school around by himself. All right. Good evening, everyone. You know, I used to follow residents for him. That's right. That's right. Wakanda. All right, here we go. Um, <laughs> I am here tonight, and I'm going um, to I'm going to defer my my um, time to some incredible uh, employees at East our district to talk about the curriculum storage system that we've created. And I want to thank the board um, for funding professional development for our teachers, uh, our curriculum days, and the support of our teacher leader model within East. The receivership funds that we received from the state paid for um, for most of that. But it was with the, the board's approval through resolutions that, that made all this work possible. Throughout this presentation, I want you to focus less on the product and more on the process. So the product is incredible. And they're going to talk, give you a repository of a curriculum that's been created, original curriculum, some that's been adopted, and some that's been adapted over the years. Uh, I will tell you that this is the first district that I've worked in where we actually have a viable curriculum in grades 6 through 12. Most districts adopt certain things, or they um, they may contract for supplemental materials, ancillary materials, but to have a, a complete curriculum in the works, grade six through 12 that's aligned and vertically aligned as well as across a grade level is something that's um, unique to this area. On some of the more national, uh, larger school districts, you see that uh, more embedded, um, but I'm telling you this, is, uh, this work has been incredible. So the process of getting teachers to open their doors and their minds and their autonomy that's often present in school settings to have them actually work in small groups and collaborative planning teams to create synergy around um, essential learnings, and understandings, and assessment has been something that we've worked on for three years. And I want to share that with you today and thank you again for allowing us to take on this work. What's important to note is that this work is and will be available to all teachers throughout the district. Uh, my caution when I met with um, Dr. Msady Miller and Dr. Golden is to do that strategically. So I thank them for coming over and giving us feedback on the, um, on the storage system. It was valuable and extremely helpful. And think about how do we scale up throughout the, throughout the district for something that you funded. You funded this, this is not uh, proprietary in nature, this is all of our work. And I'm looking forward to um, hopefully having it vetted by other teachers and throughout the district um, and, and to have it enhanced, quite frankly. So at this time, I wanna introduce and bring um, to the front Dr. Susan Meyer, who is our Chief Academic Officer. She was former um, national principal and blue ribbon uh, principal and, and uh, is currently an assistant professor at U of R who is leading this work. Uh, teacher leader Glory Bell Averello Park, who um, is a teacher leader for our upper school social studies team. Um, Dr. Mike Kelsey, teacher leader for science. Uh, Tim Graham, teacher for a uh, leader for fine arts. He does um, both art and music. And Andrew Zerlo, who's our uh, teacher on special assignment for technology. Um, they are just a small uh, group of individuals who've been working on this work. 
We also provided the board three examples from each of those content areas, history, science, and the fine arts. But I want them to walk us all through where the information is stored, and what's available, and, um, and then we're going to work more closely with Dr. Uh, Golden around how do we potentially scale this um, district-wide. So team, come on up. Hi, welcome, good evening. Our, <laughs> uh, we're really excited to be here tonight, and um, I brought my clock because <laughs> otherwise um, we can talk forever. Um, we're pretty excited about um, our curriculum storage system. No, that doesn't sound very uh, exciting, but it is. And um, I'm gonna have these guys, um, these are teacher leaders, some of the most important people I at East. And um, I'm going to have them actually show you some of the specific uh, products. We are, have handouts here. And the handouts probably don't make a lot of sense until uh, these folks talk and explain to you what we've got. Um, our purpose tonight is to make available our curriculum work. Um, and I would like to say that we're excited about it and we're also nervous about it because the, this is a five-year plan and we just finished year three. Um, and so things are about three-fifths done. I think that would be an accurate way to see it. But um, it is uh, the system that um, you made possible and to the extent that it could be useful to others, we want to make it available. We'll have to talk about exactly how to do that. And um, I've personally been in education for 38 years. I've been an administrator for 25 years. If someone had made available to me this particular system, it would have been a gold mine for me. Um, it, I, it's probably, probably shouldn't be telling tales, but um, districts' um, resources relative to curriculum are very variable. And um, this, would, this would have been something that would have in, incredibly enabled my work as a school principal, especially relative to new teachers. Uh, but, uh, and we'll show you what we're talking about in terms of how complex the system is. The one thing we're a little bit nervous about is when we do open the system up, say we open it up you know, immediately, it's live. So documents that are in the system right now, lesson plans, you could open it up and you could see someone writing on it. You could see them actually typing in it. You could see a lesson plan vanish. You could see a unit uh, come in and go out again. Uh, at the end of 1718, Andrea, um, where is she? Uh, 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 our very important tech, tech person locked it down and put it in a, a box, but now 1819 is live, so people pull out things from 1718, change them, work on them, uh, whole units will be revised. So we are talking about making available to RCSD a live system, and we, um, we'll be happy to answer questions about that. Um, it was my privilege to be one of the authors of the EPO plan, job one was guaranteed and viable curriculum. We determined to do that within the understanding by design model, um, it, which is a performance assessment system and quality initial instruction. We're only going to talk about curriculum tonight. Um, Dr. Nelms already, already talked about the fact that we originally, the original, we had cross stakeholder committee uh, curriculum groups um, that had to work very quickly in the fall of 2014. Um, to make curriculum recommendations. We thought we would be adapting and adopting more curriculum that uh, we, we are finding that we are writing much more original curriculum or more seriously adapting curriculum as we go. Um, this is, a, you can't see it, but that is the classic understanding by design um, a system that has mission and vision and New York State learning standards at the top and then goes down through a series of levels to uh, the lesson plans as we define the, um, the central elements of the lesson plans at the bottom. Right. Um, we currently have, you don't have to understand this whole slide, the key number over there is 530. We currently have 530 units. A key element of our um, approach, which I think is actually a little controversial, is that we have 100% of the teachers writing curriculum. 
um, that, is not, um, that is not a given. Often there are curriculum committees, there are subgroups that go off in the summer and write curriculum. Um, having 100% of the teachers working on curriculum re has required very extensive professional development, uh, um, expertise. We have really critical consultants who work with us. And um, I, I'm proud enough that I really feel like if you walk down the hall at East and you tapped anybody who's other than a brand new hire and asked them like high level questions about how curriculum works, you know, um, say, oh, like where are your long-term transfer goals? You know, um, how many understandings do you have and what are they aligned to? They could answer off the top of their head. They could state our mission. They could tell how our programs align to the mission. I'm incredibly proud of that. It is really because of these people here and the rest of the teacher leaders that we, um, this work's been able to be accomplished. You can't have uh, you can't have a ratio of one to one hundred when it comes to who's going to be looking at documents and reviewing them and leading the work. You just have to get that that number down lower. And teacher leaders have also subject expertise. And they're, all our teacher leaders are still teaching. No, they, um, none of them are full-time release. So they uh, walk into the classroom, they write curriculum, they actually implement themselves, they walk out, they work with the teachers on what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, and we're able to keep track of it that way. And people are able to get feedback, and it's very much live. These people work very hard. Um, I would also say, you know, adequate support, time, and expertise, and we have to thank the Board of Education for that support. It's been extremely important in the development of the system. All right, so the system consists of a t the team drive, and um, the team drive is what we want to make available to RCSD. Un um, the team drive is a series of folders. We're going to show you some of these pieces. Each, um, each folder represents a content area, um, and the content area has a master document. The master document is filled with live links. We'll show you what those look like. Every course has a course overview, which is a summary of the course and a, um, a map of what's going to happen across the year. The heart of the system are the unit plans. The unit plans, each course has maybe four to seven units. And the unit plans, stage one is what you're going to learn, stage two is how you're going to assess it, and stage three are the learning experiences, which are carefully mapped out and aligned to the understandings, which are aligned to the long-term goals, New York State learning standards, and our mission and vision, right? And those learning experiences are what you can open up and turn into your lesson plans. We have every, um, inside of each folder is a calendar. The calendars have the daily lesson plans linked to them. So if an administrator walks into a room, they can click on that link, open up today's lesson, and see what's going on in ninth grade English today. Um, every lesson plan has, to various levels, by the end of year five, we're going to be able to say this with firmness, but it's the, the end of year three, are the ancillary materials, the worksheets, the handouts, um, common formative assessments, assessment tasks, we do not have, we are not quite comfortable making public unit tests, traditional unit tests that might be things like multiple choice tests or whatnot. Those are not um, in the system right now. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tim Graham and he's going to show you some actual materials. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Again, my name is Tim Graham and I'm the uh, art and music teacher leader at East High School. And I'm going to share a little bit about the um, art team drive that we have. And you can see that right up here. As we can see, the arts curriculum encompasses, at East High School, encompasses roughly 15 separate courses, all with original content created collaboratively within the department. All curriculum is governed by the New York State Standards of the Arts. As an example of how the storage system works, we could look at the upper school studio art curriculum. Thank you for scrolling right down here. And there are the uh, components right there um, that Dr. Meyer just spoke about. Um, we're gonna look at the studio art curriculum. As an aside, eighth graders at East High School have an opportunity to receive high school credit by successfully completing the requirements for studio art. Um, the course is broken down into areas outlined by Dr. Meyer. Clicking in the highlighted areas, you can easily navigate through the different aspects of our, of our uh, developed curriculum. Let's look at the yearly overview. So the yearly overview, thank you, Andrea. This is, um, 
has the long-term transfer goals for East Mission and Vision. The overview has the big picture understandings and the performance tasks that go along with them. All the units that you're going to see at East High School through the, in the documents that are handed out or on the website look exactly this way. So you can see all the information that Andrew is going through right here. As we move, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Kalzi take it from here. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Kelsey. I've been a teacher in the city of Rochester for nine years uh, and a teacher leader at East High School for the past four years in lower school science and earth science. Um, so Andrea, if you could take us to just my master page. So this is a master page for lower school science. You can see grade six, seven, and eight science um, with all the units uh, outlined underneath for each course. Now again, the course overview is at the top, which Mr. Graham just uh, showed us for uh, studio art. And that would look the same for each of the science courses. But if we look at one of the actual unit plans within one of these uh, overviews, we'll just look at the first unit for grade seven. It's a matter unit. If you click on that. So here, this is the template that all of our units in the entire school look like. They're developed over a period of five days over the summer for the past four years in curriculum writing, as well as uh, iteratively, they're worked on um, throughout the school year, both uh, over superintendent's conference days, Wednesday PDs, and then every other day we have co cooperative planning time or, or collaborative planning time where we work in grade level teams and departmental teams to revise and refine these things. Now, here in, at the top, this is what state, Sue was, uh, Ms. Dr. Meyer was talking about with stage one. That's all the intended learning that's supposed to take place in a given unit. So that's all mission aligned as well as New York State standards aligned as well as departmental, uh, like our long-term departmental goals aligned. And then if you go down to stage two, this is where we outline that performance task system. We, we call them curriculum embedded performance tasks. These are tasks that are basically built upon throughout the unit that, uh, that drive the learning. And we hope that this engages more students and makes it more relevant for kids. Um, and feedback is a really important part through all of that process. Now, if you go to stage three at the bottom, this is kind of the guts of the unit, like the day-to-day the -day lived reality of the unit. And that is each day you can see what is being taught um, in a given classroom in seventh grade science. Now we each come to a consensus as to what the intended learning is for a day and all teachers have to kind of meet those learning objectives. But there can be some variations within that. Now if you go to the third day, Andrea, if you look down, you can't really see it, right? In like, cause it's so small, but actually right next to the name of the lesson, you don't need to click on it but there's something that says LP, and that's an actual link to the daily lesson plan that goes with that summary. Now within that lesson plan, we also then have um, the ancillary materials, like PowerPoints that would be required um, for things now, or like uh, capture sheets. Now this facilitates collaboration between not only the teachers within the department, but teachers outside of the department. So like if we're working with a special education teacher, they can go in and actually check it out, make amendments, make some modifications to it in real time. They don't need to necessarily meet face to face to do that. And then also it provides collaboration with administration um, and other departments. So if I wanted to do a project with Tim, with his class, um, I could just go into his units, see what he's doing with my students on a given month, and also try to kind of mesh that with what I'm doing in science. So it kind of provides us with cool opportunities for collaboration. Uh, throughout throughout the entire school. Now I'm going to pass it off to Gorbel Arvelo Park. Buenas noches. Um, I'm Gorbel. I've been with the district for 29 years as a um, social studies teacher, bilingual teacher, and a mentor for the district. And I'm right now I'm the social studies uh, teacher leader for the upper school. Uh, here's a snapshot of the social studies world in the upper school. What you see is the product of hundreds of hours of uh, intense professional learning, collaborative work with consultants, myself, and the social studies team. 
This happened and is still happening during CPT, as Mike uh, mentioned. Weekends, summers, after school, during school. Our mission in social studies uh, has been to develop a curriculum that is culturally responsive and connected to our community while still following the new uh, social studies framework for the state. We're going to, uh, this is what any administrator or teacher can just uh, access and then they can click on units or they can click on assessment or they can click on daily lessons. If we can, uh, Andrea, I don't know. The, yeah. So this will be what the teachers work on during CPT. So in a period of about 50 minutes to an hour, they work on a lesson where they have the same learning target, they have the same assessment, the same criteria students will be uh, assessed with, and basically the uh, learning experiences for that day, including what will be the hook and what will be the closing for that day. Then on the right you see uh, the information that the special ed teachers will, or ENL teachers will write, and then reflections for that lesson. We go back the next uh, CPT and write down reflections when we're right, uh, what we need to um, change for the next lesson, if we still have to provide students with extra practice of a specific skill that perhaps uh, they did not uh, attain that day. So we go back and that will be part of the reflection and then the next lesson will include that, uh, whatever changes we make. Um, this, I just want to mention that this uh, unit and that this lesson is part of, it requires the students uh, to do work on a curriculum task where they examine the data from their neighborhoods, uh, demographic uh, data, and they connect this data to a historical issue, which is part of the new uh, social studies framework, and then they need to bring awareness to whatever that issue is uh, and how it connects to their lives. Thank you. All right, we've gone a little bit over, so we're going to close fast. Um, to, in, to summarize, we've created a common curriculum. Um, I think it's deeply understood by our folks. It's mission aligned. It's culturally relevant. Teachers are able to support one another. They build on one, each other's ideas. They work collaboratively, which sounds great, but is actually much harder than it sounds. We are in a continuous improvement model, and um, every unit that we're working on uh, could be better, and we are committed to that. Um, it allows us to increasingly focus on student needs when we're not all so busy um, creating all the materials, each individually ourselves. And um, I we'd like to say again, we, we understand that this represents a, a major investment in teachers and in teachers' learning and in teacher leadership, but thank you for letting us present. You said yeah, any questions for Dr. Nelms? Comments? I, I do have one. Um, just in terms of a little history, people uh, may not remember that uh, East High School had like a 31% graduation rate the year before you all took over. Is that right? 33. Yeah. 33. Uh, and the goal at the time for, for the district was to turn around a, our worst performing school, had the highest suspension rates, the worst attendance rates, and the worst graduation rates. Uh, but that was just one of the goals, and people may not remember this, but the second goal, and we said it repeatedly, was to create an incubator of success, an incubator for best practices. We realized at the time then, and we realize now, that you can't build this to scale. You can't have 25 or 13 uh, uh, EPOs. Wouldn't want to. And we understood that it's not necessary. So I, I want to tell you, it was encouraging for you he to hear you begin your conversation, uh, Sean, uh, Dr. Nellis, by referencing Dr. Golden. Uh, I think one of the first things you said is you said something about curriculum, and then you mentioned Dr. Golden's name. That is fulfilling that second purpose behind that EPO. 
which is to create a school within our district that can serve as an incubator for best practices. We have struggled, we have talked about the failure to have a consistent, because uh, we do have a curriculum, but to have a consistent curriculum uh, that is workable and successful throughout the district. And it is good to hear that you're talking about that. But the question I have, having said that, the question I have is, there's two uh, theories of, uh, of thought on this from my layperson's vantage point. One is to have a standard curriculum throughout the district, or there are some who have advised us as board members that what we need to do is appreciate that schools are different, right? And allow that kind of professional uh, flexibility to influence the curriculum at each school. If we were to take this incubator of success best practices approach, is there flexibility in the model maybe that's not the accurate phrase, that you've just presented, Dr. Meyer, to allow a school uh, on the other side of the city to use that curriculum framework, uh, but adapt it to their needs. I don't know if that question makes sense. I would say, I think um, <clears throat> Jean-Claude used to use the term bounded autonomy. Bounded autonomy. Yeah, I think that um, the moment you break away from the, um, the critical standards and essential learnings, and allow individuals to become, um, play outside of that bounded autonomy. Um, you no longer can guarantee a parent that when a child enters pre-K and they, they leave 12th grade, they've had a consistent experience across the board. So we know that even within East, um, there, are, there are autonomies within, within the structure. People can bring in new materials, and, and, but it's, always, it's also agreed upon among the teachers. They say beforehand, I'm gonna try this, and they come back and talk about it, if it was successful or not, and how to make those adjustments. Um, I'll also say that one of the strengths of the EPO plan is that all teachers post their lesson plans daily. So we have access to that, those lesson plans daily. So as the administrator walks through, a teacher leader walks through, or a special ed teacher, ELL, ELL teacher, or a bilingual teacher, they have access to the material that kids are going to have. And I think Gloria Bell um, quickly went through and said, you know, this is, and they also comment on those lessons. So when we say live, it's live because there is and there are autonomies within the structure but no one can go outside of it and refuse to implement it. And so, um, again, I've said this repeatedly at other board meetings, when a parent enters ES6, if they stay through 12, I should be able to say to them, this is the guaranteed viable curriculum and experience your kids will have, um, regardless of who the teacher is who's sitting in front of you. Some teachers will go off and do incredible things and expand that content, but the context and content shouldn't be so different from classroom to classroom. Commissioner Homer? Yeah, I just want to say I'm really impressed. Um, fabulous. Um, project. Um, I really like that it's online, so you have that transparency and accountability because you can see, as you're saying, you know what's going on in every classroom. Um, I also like that that transparency online allows people to collaborate because I find that you learn so much from your colleagues as a teacher. So you know, having it easily available. Uh, it, it sometimes it's, we get into silos as teachers and, and it's hard to see each other's work so that's that's a really great way of keeping keeping everybody uh, aware and it, it makes it more live um, and I I've always been a, a strong believer in teachers writing curriculum because it just keeps you on your toes you know and to be able to talk about other people uh, about your work with other people so um, I say thumbs up thanks Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so this is probably a question for both superintendents. Now, we just hired um, Dr. Willis, the director of African American Studies, and I would like to know um, how either superintendent plans on utilizing him or if you have already started utilizing him. I know he's not here to speak about the work that he's been doing, um, but we hired him for a very critical role, and I just want to know how he's being used. I can speak. I have not met Dr. Willis yet um, at East. Um, and that's the first time I heard his name. So I'm looking forward to, to meeting Dr. Willis um, in that department. I know that the office has had, I know the office has had some transitions. Um, we, currently, we've used Dr. Um, Sonia James Wilson as our consultant for CRE work. Um, she's also local. Um, but I, I know that the district was in the process of hiring someone. So I look forward to meeting, um, to meeting him. And again, this, this is a live document. So we would hope that he would take a look at some of these units and give us feedback on how to enhance that. Um, and we're, this is not a closed system. Like we encourage feedback, and that's why we're making it live, because we know it's not um, a, um, it, it's the, there's, there's flaws within the system. But again, that's why I said the beginning. I want to focus on the process, like getting people to really open their doors and to collaborate and think thoughtfully 
was, was the best experience that, that will come out of this. More importantly, if the district decides to, which I hope they don't, they decide to um, no longer partner with the EPO beyond year five, the learning that was done by teachers, those, those teachers will still be there. And so it would continue because it's work that they put in and created. Farmer, do you want to respond to that? So I think first of all, um, certainly the, the understanding by design model and the notion of bounded autonomy is very consistent with what we're trying to bring into this district. It's very similar to what Dr. Brizard had organized here, but it's really critical that people understand the state learning standards as well as assessments for learning and the tight alignment of that is what ensures equity among our buildings. When we talk about our um, African American Studies director, he's looking at curriculum specifically for Pan African Studies courses as well as specific courses in the district. But in addition, he's serving to guide the in insurance of a uh, curriculum that reflects the learners individually. So um, he's somebody that we use throughout the curriculum with all of our other teaching and learning executive directors. So um, we see him as very, very helpfully presented this summer at the leadership retreat. And I'm very happy that the systems are really using the opportunity to see the work at East as an opportunity for us to really use and modify as needed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage us to all get together with him because I think he'd be very helpful to great. the process. Commissioner yeah, LeBron, great. I'll get back to you. Well, first I want to commend you guys on the incredible amount of work that you guys have put into putting this curriculum together. I certainly can appreciate it. I'm sure as a parent, other parents appreciate that their children have a kind of a guidance, right, of, of what they're learning and that parents can also comprehend this, that it's not curriculum that if they were to pick up, they would not be able to understand. So I can appreciate that. Um, I know that you guys mentioned potentially collaborating and bringing it over on this end for the other schools, potentially, but I just want to know that there were some critical components um, that included teacher leaders for to be point persons for the curriculum, collaboration of all teachers and adequate support, time and expertise. And I would ask that if we do look at implementing this at other schools, that those critical components are still there, that we don't water it down at our, on our end um, and assume expertise from other individuals who may not be teacher leaders in the schools. So I just want to put that on the record. Um, the other thing is I would like to request a presentation, may potentially at the next board meeting, of what Jason, Dr. Willis is actually doing, because I know that you guys have said that there's been presentations and that he's created some curriculum somewhere along the way, but I personally would like to have a full presentation on his actual work curriculum and where it's being implemented for the next board meeting. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that's a good idea. Thank you, Commissioner LeBron and Commissioner Shepard. Um, he, he's a new employee and, and I think everybody would do well to read the original enabling resolution which called for comprehensive infusion uh, not just in African African American studies, but in mathematics. So, so uh, I, I think you've heard that. But I think that's right, Commissioner LeBron. Maybe Perfect. I don't know when it would be uh, practical, but I do think we need an update from him or yeah. whoever you designate oh, no. to tell us how uh, we, as a district, are going to use him. So, so Sean, the same thing to you that we're saying to Barbara. Um, we'd like to see how you're utilizing him. Absolutely. All right. Um, uh, Commissioner Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just one simple question. Now you said it was partial or is still under construction. You mentioned visual arts, science, and global tonight. Do you have ELA and, and uh, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, every single subject is, re is um, here. Now there's a, there are a few electives that if it wasn't a teacher's main course, mm -hmm. then it won't have a fully developed curriculum. But um, we're right now six through 12 almost every course in the school has all the components. You know, you might not have all the um, ancillary materials that go with each lesson plan um, yet. But again, it's year three. So by year five, once you've gone back through the materials again and refined them and changed them again, I'm, I'm really excited about what that's going to look like. But it, it, in my opinion, it's useful right now. Mm -hmm. you know? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thanks. 
thanks again. We appreciate that. Um, next on our agenda is our uh, reports uh, from our various organizations. We'll begin with, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we'll begin with our standing committee reports. Uh, Van, can I ask the question before yeah, we start? Sure, there was sure. a, there's another report in here. Um, about the summer school crisis report of inquiry. Was someone presenting yeah, this tonight? I, I'm, I'm going to address that in my presence report. Okay. Yep. Um, all right, so uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice President Powell, do you want to give us your finance committee report? Uh, since Commissioner Powell is, is whispering in uh, Mr. Jobs' <laughs> ear. I, I'm uh, a, no, I'm that's, that's quite all right. Uh, let, me, let me just say, and we have to do this part of uh, our open meetings uh, law, we uh, assign, um, as part of our bylaws, a mentor to our student leader. And Commissioner Powell, since you're conveniently sitting next to, uh, <laughs> that would be appreciated. Do you accept that assignment? Anybody have any objection to that assignment? And, and of course, let me just say, we're accessible to, to you, we're accessible to you at any time. So, but I see you're already taking advantage of the location. <laughs> the next, so feel free to continue to do that. Uh, Vice President Powell, you have a report for finance? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, the Finance Committee met last Thursday on the 20th. Um, um, we reviewed East, East's EPO's August financial reports. Um, we have those. Uh, if um, I, I would at this time like to um, move that they be received by the board. I make that motion. It's been seconded. We got a second? Yep. Great. All those in favor say aye. I was going to let you do that. <laughs> All those in you. favor say aye. 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 Any objection? Thank you. Thank you. We also have the full district report, and that is at the dais in front of you. Um, this is the report for August, which is the new fiscal year. It does not, it is, um, we don't have the year end, which we will see when, when the books are closed. Um, so this is the um, August 2018 financial report for the district. I move that the board receive it, this report. So moved. Right. Is there a second? Commissioner Punches? Sure. <laughs> she says sure. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we also have the student activities funds report um, that went through the committee uh, and um, it was advanced to the full board. I move that the board receive this student activity funds report. I'll second that motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. After the standard reports, we had um, uh, quite a list of resolutions numbered from um, resolution 247 and 248 to six, um, 270, 271, 274 through 306 and resolution 308. Um, these included uh, a couple of HCI initiatives, which we don't usually see, but they, um, they were um, budget neutral um, reallocations. We had um, the, East, um, the East EPO contracts. We have one procurement and supply and a host of educational facilities, um, resolutions, many of them standing contracts that were either, um, uh, either uh, uh, extended from previous uh, contracts or uh, new uh, RFPs put out and a new um, contractor selected. Um, that uh, summarizes each of the uh, resolutions before you. Um, we did have a late submission to resolution 270 was a late submission following the pattern of, um, of um, uh, 270 and 271. Uh, these are budget neutral reallocations for salaries um, and all were uh, and all were recommended by the board uh, finally um, 
September's finance meeting uh, featured a discussion of uh, the New York State School Funding Transparency Report, which is available on um, uh, the state's website. Uh, it, we, we did get a PowerPoint presentation that sort of dissected it a little bit. Um, uh, this is the first year that the ESSA legislation required annual reports at the school level. Um, and um, it details the total funding, al funding allocation to the school by subtracting specific budget items that are, for instance, transportation or other centrally um, uh, governed uh, activities. Um, and um, so it's a detailed statement of the total funding allocation for each school for the upcoming budget year. And these are actual salaries, for instance, of, of in teachers, as opposed to our budget, which is built around average salaries. So one of the things that you can learn by looking at these reports is how uh, a teacher longevity can affect the actual funding that's driven to each school. And um, this, this form seeks, this is straight out of the law, seeks to capture school districts um, rationales for school level funding from state, local, and federal sources. Um, our CFO, um, Everton Sewell's presentation um, exhibited an allocation of funds within RCSD and um, provided a comparison of the centralized costs between ourselves and other big five schools that would be Yonkers, um, Buffalo, and Syracuse. So that summarizes my report. Our next finance committee meeting is October 16th. Thank you, uh, Vice President Powell. Uh, Commissioner Funches. Yes. All right, on Wednesday, September 19th, the Policy Committee met to review feedback obtained from the principal's cabinet meeting with proposed changes to the visitors to schools policy. The principal suggested modifying the policy to state that administrative staff will escort parents to their child's classroom when a classroom visit has been requested, and the 24-hour notice is encouraged for scheduling parent meetings with teachers. Um, the 24-hour notice is needed because of the time that the meeting would take the teacher out of the classroom. Um, the superintendent and I plan to meet with um, Dr. Adam Urbanski to discuss options for gathering feedback around the same proposed policy changes from teachers. The policy committee plans to review the feedback obtained from all stakeholders, parents, principals, and teachers in the October meeting. And considering the, um, and, but I want to say also to this is that as we as move forward as a policy committee, we want to try and make sure that as we move forward as a district, we move forward with all members being heard with equity. So whenever something like this comes up, we will be speaking to who, all the people who are involved and all people who are impacted, be it parents, students, teachers, administrators, so that we can move forward together. Um, in considering proposed alternative and homebound instruction policy, members of the policy committee requested data pertaining to student outcomes for each of the RCSD alternative programs. Dr. Gio Martino presented the following data on four, uh, for four alternative programs, North Star, All City, uh, RIA, and Young Mothers in Interim Health. Um, they, they presented, he presented enrollment in each program for the last three years, percentage of students in each program who were e um, English language learners or students with a disability for the last three years, average daily attendance, dropout rates, and per pupil cost for each program for the last three years. Additional detail has been requested as well as data for other district alternative programs, links, big picture, new beginnings, et cetera. Superintendent regulations are to be developed to establish timeframes for providing alternative instruction to students, particularly when a student has been removed from the classroom, placed in ISS, or put on short-term suspension. The regulations will also stipulate the data to be collected for monitoring and reporting on provision of alternative instructions to students. This data will be reported quarterly. Three proposed policies were approved by the policy committee and have been advanced to the board in this evening's meeting for information items. Um, the proposed student harassment and bullying prevention policy, the new proposed teaching, and con teaching of controversial issues policy, and the um, proposed revision of the sexual harassment policy. There are two po um, there are policy um, things up for discussion. 
the new proposed high school to higher education institutions policy to require um, school counselors to prepare a college and career plan for each student by the end of ninth grade and propose revision to the board bylaws to reinstate the board's human resources committee. To be, to be brought up for considered, to be considered for adoption tonight are the proposed student health services policy, which expands on the existing policy for students with serious and or, and or life-threatening medical conditions to address the health screenings required by, for enrollment in school, administering a medication to students, and notifying parents in emergency and non-emergency situations and dealing with communicable diseases. Also, the proposed revision to the girl gifts to district officers and employees policy and the new proposed wandering and elopement policy. New, also, we have the new proposed indemnification policy 6300. In addition, the policy committee is exploring opportunities for obtaining parents' input regarding proposed changes to parent and family engagement policy. And committee members also received recommendations of the School Climate Advisory Committee for amending the Code of Conduct, which will be reviewed and discussed in detail in the October meeting. Um, at this time, I'd like to take a point of personal privilege to really thank the School Climate Advisory Committee for their hard work. And um, as being that I have the unique vantage point of being on the committee before I was on the board, I know that this is a group of people who have worked tirelessly for not just a couple of months, but for a couple of years in different permutations to bring this work to this place. So I just want to give you my personal thanks for doing that. And that, and our next meeting will be October 16th following the Finance Committee, and that's the conclusion of my report. Thank you, Commissioner Funches. Um, uh, Commissioner Homer? Yes, the board. Uh, governance committee has not met since the last business meeting, although as per one of the areas of governance, I'd like to report that the board did have a second retreat last evening to continue our work on developing ourselves as a team. And I want to thank our facilitator, Maisha Inaharo, for doing a great job. Uh, the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for November 20th at 5.30 p.m. She did do a great job, and uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for turning up, and thank Barbara for uh, making your home or your community room available for us. It was a great spot, and everybody brought food. It wasn't done on your taxpayer dollars, um, so it was good, good food and good company. Uh, Commissioner LeBron? Yeah, so the audit committee met on Tuesday, September 18th. Um, we met with the board auditor general to review the results from the 2018 risk assessment and the proposed audit plan for this upcoming year. All board members, superintendent, um, and Dr. Aquino were present and participated in the discussion. We did not get through the entire um, plan, but we will be having a follow-up meeting in October to go over the risk, of the risk assessment and the proposed audit plan. Um, but some key things that came up in terms of the audit was uh, district culture, leadership, accountability, school operations, supervision, and student achievement as some of the areas of that were critical for this district to be focused on and looking at. Um, and so again, we didn't have an opportunity to finish it, but we will set a date in October. I'm working on that right now with Anissa to send that out to the board and make it public so if other folks want to come. Um, also at that meeting, we're going to receive an update on the financial audit from our external auditors as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks. Um, the student, the Excellence in Student Achievement Committee, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> We met on Tuesday, September 4th. Um, we discussed plans on expanding our athletic department. Um, I know many of you know that that's been something that's near and dear to me. So I really want um, us as a district to really start boosting our student athletes because they excel in more things than just academia. Um, so we are going to have a master calendar that is easier for parents in the community to check in one spot what sports are going on on what day so that we can boost our attendance for those things. Um, I did request a date. I know in the ESA committee they talked about um, it being something that was simple and so I would like a date to know when we're going to get that up and running. Um, our superintendent also mentioned that she would like to have a master calendar with all the activities whether it's sports or anything else that's going on in those days. So we're looking forward to making those changes on our website. 
Um, the committee also received pre uh, preliminary projections regarding our August graduation rate, which we just received a presentation uh, from the administration. And we also had a conversation in regards to holding staff accountable um, throughout the year so that we're making sure that if we are not achieving our standards that we're keeping a closer eye on what's happening and we can make adjustments as the school year goes along. Our next ESA committee meeting is going to be on Tuesday, October 9th. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Sure. You have a, a rather unpretentious report here with no cover page. This is the this is the um, presentation that Everton Sewell provided the Finance Committee comparing our district um, um, school um, cost per pupil, comparing it to the other big four. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Everton is in the audience. You can approach him after the board meeting, I'm sure. Just wanted you to know what that what this is in your on the dais in front of you. I'll try to be brief um, for my president's report I um, wanted to direct your attention to a 2018 school summer school crisis report that is on the desk in front of you it is offered um, as a result of um, members of the Board of Education expressing concern about how uh, we had some challenges at the beginning of summer school uh, 2000, beginning of 2018. Um, what you have in front of you is what I'm describing as an executive summary, uh, but there is a full report available upon your request. Uh, Dr. Lee can make sure that you get a copy of that. Uh, you will note that there is a series of findings and recommendations on the last two page. I would direct your attention to those last two pages. Uh, we will ensure that those recommendations are ad adhered to, but after you have had an opportunity to review that report and you believe uh, that it perhaps needs to be an agenda item at some future meeting, we can certainly do that. We just won't do it tonight. I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to digest the report, look at the broader report. It's quite extensive, um, and there may be some matters that we would not be even to talk about uh, publicly because of... Uh, personnel uh, considerations. So uh, I, I, I ask that you take the time to read that report. It's a good report. I want to thank Carl Christoph, and uh, I'm sure there are others who I'm neglecting to mention. Carl, you will thank them on behalf of the board. I would appreciate that. Um, so uh, that leaves with me uh, one word that I began this meeting with, uh, two words that I began this meeting with, and I will end my report with. Thank you. Um, I had the blessing and the opportunity to attend a number of the um, openings. A number of you were there. I think, uh, I think I saw everybody at the openings at one opening or another. Um, I think it's important that we use those two very simple words to thank uh, those folks that made that happen. It's incredible. Uh, when you look at some of our schools, they are just, you know, one of the things that you, you have to believe that at home or at school or wherever you are, your environment makes you feel either pretty bad or can make you feel pretty good. What I have seen, what you have seen in some of these schools, the modernization efforts, is just remarkable. The, the capacity to change a teacher or a cafeteria person or a custodian or a student's view about who they are and how valued they are. Uh, the opportunities are just endless at some of these schools. They just did an amazing job. So on behalf of the board, I want to thank people in transportation, facilities, food services, uh, all the employees that work tirelessly to make those schools um, good places for children and families to learn. Uh, I also think it's important uh, that the board thank folks that uh, aren't our employees. There are so many contractors and subcontractors, and I hope <coughs> you all have had the time to stay up late tonight and watch this telecast, because the Board of Education wants to thank you too. Uh, artisans, craftsmen, um, carpenters, uh, as I said, contractors and subcontractors, uh, true craftsmen and women who made those schools, literally, we started talking about works of art, those schools are absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So, um, and then finally, uh, the last set of people that are, are not employees are the parents and students. You all know, 
Uh, for the last few years, we've talked about schools being displaced and uh, other schools for months, and they thought they were going to be coming back sooner, and then they were told, for example, at Monroe, no, 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 you can't come back. So finally, the Board of Education, uh, last but not least, would say thank you to the parents, students, and families who put up with the, log lo the logistics of putting this stuff together. And I, I've called them out a couple times, and I'll call them out one more time, Mike. This is it for this year, maybe. Thank you again, uh, and accept that thanks on behalf of the Board of Education, and please make sure you share that with everybody who you work with and work for to make our schools, once again, a great place for our families and children to learn and play. Thanks. All right, that concludes my report. Van, yeah. can yes, I? Yes, ma'am. I, I, there's a couple of requests that I want to do. One, sure. I want to have an actual date on when we're going to digest this um, with what happened with summer school. I'm not comfortable just kind of briefly skimming it. And yeah. I did read this report as soon as I got here, so I had a lot of questions around it. But I'm not comfortable just skimming through this and pretending that it was not a huge error. Um, there's a couple of things in here, though. Um, I don't agree that finance committee or the chair, which would be Commissioner Powell, was even involved in any of this. That's one. Two, um, when we talked about the 10 million, I know that when this happened, there were some discrepancies around the number. But I did go back, and I think I mentioned this to this board, that I went back to the April 9th budget hearing and that we were actually never originally budgeted for 10 million for summer school. So I know that that number kept getting thrown out there. But the number at the April 9th meeting was 8.5 million. So I'm not comfortable, and I just want to throw this out there, but I want to have an actual date for this board to digest this and have an in-depth conversation, not only about the findings, but also the accountability, because I don't feel like anybody's been held accountable at the end of the day for this error, and there should be somebody held accountable. I want to throw that on the record. You, 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 that's absolutely fine. You put it on the record. And I don't think I said anything that was inconsistent with that. In fact, I, I think I said because I wrote it here. If you believe there needs to be, this needs to be an agenda item in a future meeting, we will do that. And I hear you, and I'm not surprised that you say that. I think what you say makes sense. I just did not believe it made sense to have that discussion tonight. It was literally under a pack of materials. Half of my materials are, are here. The other half are here. And it was buried. No one has the time to really do what I think you rightly want to do. We should set it aside, aside some time to make it a separate agenda item, and we will do that. All right? Uh, we just are not going to compare calendars right now, but we will definitely do that. It deserves that kind of discussion. And it deserves for everybody to have the opportunity to not just skim over it. And again, I would, I would indicate the fact that I talked about it tonight and suggested that we if someone thought it was necessary to have a meeting. There was no one pretending that it didn't happen. And in fact, you have the report there in front of you that said it did happen. And, and that came about because a number of board members, I think yourself included, but certainly myself and others said, hey, listen, we got some problems in summer school. So again, I want to thank Carl for getting the report done. I think when people have a chance to read the full report, they'll get even more detail and probably even have more questions. And we'll have an appropriate time to, to discuss it at a future meeting. Commissioner Hallmark? You said that's on board docs, your report? I don't know if it's on board docs just yet. No, it's not. And I don't think it will be uh, because I think there's some personnel information in there. Is that right, Carl? So, uh, but again, any, any board member can have access to it. And Dr. Lee, as I said earlier on, will make sure that you get it. Okay? Um, any other questions about my presence report? All right, so let's move on to the consideration of resolutions. I need a motion to discuss resolution 232 through 248. Those are East High School resolutions. So Any takers? Commissioner Hallmark has moved it. Is there a second by somebody? Second. Commissioner uh, LeBron. Any questions or comments regarding resolutions 232 to 248? There being no questions or comments, all those in favor of Educational Partnership Organization resolutions 232 to 248 say aye. 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 Any opposition? All right, thank you. Uh, I need a motion to discuss resolution 249 to 271, Human Capital Initiative. So moved. Been moved by Commissioner Hallmark, seconded by Second. Commissioner Funches. Any questions or comments regarding those particular resolutions? Hold on. All right. Which resolutions did this you just say? 249 to 271. Uh, hold on, Van. I have some highlighted. Take your time. Um, 270 and 271, I want to pull out and have a discussion at the dais about these resolutions. 
Okay, now, the nature of your question, does it relate to a particular employee? No, it, it pertains to the actual resolutions themselves. Okay, so, so it's appropriate to do that now. You, I, I, I offered, and the motion was made and seconded, to discuss 249 to 271, so you can, you can do that now. So, in regards to resolution 270 and 271, um, I just want to put this on the record because, one, I am completely outraged that the fact that we even have these resolutions in front of us, and for those who may not be able to see these resolutions, we have two departments in this district that had some leftover money that they were budgeted for. That they did not use the money that they were originally budgeting the money for and decided to come up with what they called an equity uh, raise for individuals two days before their 3% contractual raise. And I have a district right now, I have students at Edison High School, bilingual students, who do not have bilingual books or materials in September 2018. I discussed this last school year, we didn't have school books for our bilingual students. Um, in a district where we have a deficit in this district, that money should have been distributed back to the general fund so that we can adequately su supply our students with the materials that they need. Now, I know that some of the justification is that this money was already budgeted it for them in that school year. I get that. And that the money was left over because they didn't use it. However, again, when we have a district with a deficit and our students have deficits in the classroom, that money should have went back into this general fund and back to our schools. Um, in addition to that, we talk about equity. There's no equity when our students can't read or write or do math. It just enrages me so much as a mother in this district as well. So I'm not just speaking from a board member. As a parent in this district, that money is, is our children's money and it's our taxpayer dollars and they should have went back to the district. We're talking about two districts days before they were already going to get a 3% contractual raise. And so I'm saying this on the record because I want people who are out there who are not here who are seeing this video to understand that this is the type of stuff that is happening in the district and that nobody's actually speaking out against. And it went through apparently the finance committee and I got to put them on the spot and I'm going to exclude Commissioner Shepard. She was not at that meeting. Um, but this is unacceptable to me and the board should not be approving this and this happened in June 20, uh, 28th, and it's September, and we're just hearing about it and getting a resolution. Commissioner Funches. Um, Harry, I have a question, but mine does pertain to something, an individual, so I'd ask you to come to the dais, please. No, no. There is an individual listed here who, you go over there, there's an individual listed in Resolution 270 that I was under the um, understanding that there is a change in the scope of work for that individual. Is that, is that am I accurate in my, in my understanding of that? Yes, yes, you are accurate with that. And also, I would also add that if you want to talk in as far as specifics, mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to do that in an executive cabinet if you yeah. want. Okay, I just, I just, session. no, cause, because the reason I'm asking this is that I see that there is a difference in what's being asked in 270 versus 271, because in 270, if there's a change in scope of work. There was. There okay, was. I just want to, so we yeah. can take that in executive cabinet. That's fine. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Um, with respect to Commissioner LeBron's comments, um, I hate to put people on the spot, but it's the nature of democracy. It has to be transparent. Right. Commissioner LeBron has expressed some concerns about how this happened. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to um, incorrectly paraphrase your comments to me, uh, Mr. Kennedy yes. or Mr. Kristoff, but I'm going to attempt to do my best and use some very brief words. I think that apologies were rendered. I think people conceded that they missed something. And if I'm misconstruing uh, your comments to me, and I think they were made in an open meeting, uh, tell me that. But what I heard from you and from Mr. Kristoff was we missed something. And I, I, think, I think she raised some concerns, but I think people need to hear what your response is. I heard it. I heard it in a public meeting. But essentially what I heard is we did not recognize, we did not see that there was a resolution, a, a board regulation that required board approval prior to 
uh, the granting of these increases, which were more than 3%, because there's a resolution, there's a re regulation that requires board approval for any salary increase above 3%. And because I, like Commissioner LeBron, wanted to know, hey, what the heck is going on here? Because, by the way, the system worked to a certain extent because we had commissioners and our Auditor General point this out. I spent hours on the phone with her. I know Commissioner LeBron and others were very concerned about this. And we asked people what happened. And I spoke to both of you. Um, and I, it was in a public meeting, so this is nothing, I think, for executive session. I'd ask that you share so people hear. Because she said, I want to speak to everybody out there. And she should. But you should, too. Sure. Tell me about you told everybody sure. else. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I shared at the Finance Committee was this, President White, that first of all, uh, one of my core values is my integrity. And I would never do anything to jeopardize my integrity, nor would I do anything to jeopardize the trust that the board as well as the superintendent has in me. When I first heard or was aware that there was a equity adjustment made, and this is when I believe, um, and, and Carl can speak for himself, but he did come to the Finance Committee in June. And when he came to the Finance Committee in June, there was some discussion about an equity adjustment for the legal department. And when he mentioned to me or shared that with me, I did not remember the 2016 um, um, uh, adjustment or the, the, in the contract for the 2016 for the exempt um, contract that did state that you have to go to the board for, for increases. I totally forgot about that, and for that, I'm sorry, or I apologize for that. But again, as I indicated earlier, um, one of my values is my integrity, and I would never undermine that integrity or the trust of the board. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Christoph, do you want to say anything? It's up to you. Not particularly unless the board gets question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Shepard. Um, so my comment is not necessarily to, to sit up here and talk about, you know, your integrity or your mistakes. I mean, we're all human. Um, my issue comes again that we have a resolution before us that we're going to pass, but the work has already, the process has already been, been put in place. And that's a huge problem for me. And I feel that we need to figure out how to get that money back because you can't just give people raises nilly willy and then come here and say it's a mistake. And we as a board don't hold somebody accountable. Like who signed off on these raises without it coming to the board. Like this is not, these are not new procedures. People get raises all the time throughout the district. And again, this is not to attack anybody's integrity, but like where do we as a board say that we're not gonna allow this to happen no matter what the amount was. I know in, in one of the departments it was about 15 to $16,000, but still like we need to decide as a board how we're gonna correct this, whether we have to get the money back, whether we have to write somebody up, like something has to happen because it's just too serious. <laughs> like, and it's not, I mean, we have to do something as a board. Um, I'm not sure what that process looks like, but I would like for us to figure out a way to retract whatever money that was given as a raise. If people want to do this, then it has to go through the right process. This is not the first time, but I'm trying to make this the last time that we continue to go through things like this. Vice President Powell. Um, the last two speakers have suggested this is a very straightforward mistake. And I would like to suggest uh, uh, that, that's not entirely correct. The positions being outlined here, there are only 20 out of thousands of employees in the district. They are the exempt group. They are not the superintendent's exempt group, that they are not in any other bargaining unit. The language in that regulation that talks about increases to um, above three and a half percent fall in a section of the regulation referring to performance increases. There is nothing in the regulation that specifically speaks to equity adjustments where someone has, by virtue of their longevity in the district or uh, shifting of positions, lateral uh, changes, did not um, get um, market rate increases uh, 
throughout their careers. For example, the regulation is ambiguous. The, um, when it was presented to the Finance Committee in June, it was stated there is nothing in it, there's nothing governing this. And that's actually a true statement. It is not a misrepresentation at all if you, if you take the letter of the law regulation. The part of the regulation that's being called into question is for performance increases. And it, it, some of you are going to say I'm splitting hairs, but the reason it's in front of us now is that looking back on it, they thought, okay, let's bring it before the board and, and just to make it right, even though the, the um, regulations don't specifically speak to an equity adjustment. It is budget neutral, which is why it, when we discussed it in June, we didn't take action in June. So I don't want people to walk away thinking that somebody got away with something. It's not that cut and dry. Okay, I've got a, 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 a list of folks who want to speak. I'm going to begin with Commissioner Shepard, then we'll go with Commissioner Funches, uh, Commissioner LeBron, and then uh, Dr. Aquino. Um, and so, uh, Vice President Powell, that's even more alarming to me that there's nothing written for equity and staff would take it upon themselves to just do something with money. We're talking about money here. Do something with money without there not being a reg or going through somebody. So my question is to Superintendent um, Dean Williams, did you know that this stuff was going on and, and what, was, what was your thought process or who approved this? And, like I, like, I need an explanation um, as to how this would occur, uh, as to how staff would just give raises and there's no regulation. Um, I think we're going to need to do that in executive session so that I can speak freely. That's fine. Um, Commissioner Funches? What I, what I think that we're speaking to is a matter of principle. If there, if you, if there is a pol if there's a policy you're talking about, you know, performance about all these things. If there's something that does not fall within that, then there's that, and that should have been brought as the question. So my thing is, if there was nothing in there to address an equity adjustment, then there should have been a question asked, and there should have been something brought to the board to say, you know, is there room? Can this be done? It's not because it's like saying that um, I tell my children uh, don't, go, don't go play in the front grass, but they go play on the front pavement. Because I didn't say pavement, I meant don't, if I, say, if I say don't go outside and play in the yard, or don't go outside and play, if, there, if I have one line that doesn't say don't play on the grass, don't play on the pavement, don't play on the thing, if there's a question you ask, well mom, my, my children will come to me and ask, well mom, can I do this? All we're saying is did the question, I think that what's being said here is that the question didn't get brought so that it, there could be a discussion. This is not about, you know, the integrity of anybody. This is, not, this is about when a question gets asked. If we have a position, we didn't get a chance, we didn't get a chance to have that discussion. That, that the opportunity was taken away. And I think that's what the point is. Um, so I want to make some, I, I didn't even realize that the resolution, that there's no actual language around equity. Now it just feels like somebody just made it up. There is not going to be, um, there's not going to be any explanation for any of these individuals and nothing against them. But some of these folks are already three figures. I detest the fact that we are saying that this is a cost neutral. This is not cost neutral. It is a 3% uh, uh, raise contractually to a, a raise two days before the 3%. That is a short term view to look at it that it's cost neutral right now because the money was left over this year. This is going to have financial implications next year, the year after that 
that and the year after that and ongoing until these individuals are no longer here. So this is not just right now a, a cost neutral. It can't be cost neutral. Let, let me just throw this out there. It can never be cost neutral. It may be cost neutral right in this moment, but the fact that it was cost neutral before their 3% raise, once they got the 3% raise on top of the redistribution of that money, that no longer made it cost neutral. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, I also want to understand if this came to the board in June, to the finance committee in June, why did we not have, and this went into effect June 28th, why was this not discussed before June 28th um, in the June board meeting? Uh, why was this not discussed into July or August? We're hearing about it now in September. And I'm with Natalie, I'm going to back her on this. We need to figure out a way to get our money back. Um, and I don't know if that what that requires, um, but we need to have that critical conversation. Dr. Keno. So the way I see this is that obviously if this is coming to the board for a vote means that the, the board had to approve this, which should have come before June 28. Because right now, what would happen if the board votes these two de resolutions down. So it seems like there must be a resolution that indicates that the board needed to approve this. Because if not, I'm assuming it would not have come. It would not have come to you today. So if it came to you, this should have come before yeah. June 20, 28. Obviously, there, as, as Mr. Kennedy said, there was a mistake, which I think is what Commissioner Shepard was saying then, the issue of the accountability, and what happens, I'm looking at you, Mr. Christopher, what happens if it voted down? Uh, well, let, let me just uh, address two things, Dr. Kino. Um, how this happened, how this ended up being voted on today is, to one extent, the system did work. Our claims auditor and our auditor general began a conversation about this. They saw this as irregular. They came to board members, myself included, and we began to have conversation, began to have conversation with the affected departments. So that's how nobody was thinking that it, and, and that's why I appreciate you, Mr. Kennedy, saying what you, what you weren't aware of or had forgotten. And that's why there was no resolution, because the people that were giving these particular um, raises did not think a resolution was required. Thankfully, claims audit, auditor general picked this up and began a conversation with, ended with me. And then I said, listen, let's get this straightened out. So that's why it's ended up here today, because there had to be a resolution. So uh, the, 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 the other thing that I wanted to say is this is actually, with increases, has never happened that I'm aware of. I've been on the board. Uh, 10 years. I've never seen this happen before. I can tell you though, and I, I appreciate somebody said this, and it's true, we all make mistakes, because check this out. It might not have affected you all, but I think Liz, you were here, and Willie were here. We had a situation where the Board of Education received the raise, and we weren't supposed to get that raise. And I can tell you what happened with that. I, I can speak about it because I'm one of the board members. We had to give the money back. It was painful. <laughs> But we had to give the money back. And how did we figure that out? Once again, the Auditor General, our employee, the board's employee, figured it out. Anissa, thank you very much. You're doing a good job. So that's how it works. I don't know how this will end up. We're gonna, I'm going to need a new motion to discuss Resolution 249 to 269. And we'll continue to have this discussion in the executive session because I think if we continue to go further, it may implicate a discussion of particular employees' rights. I think we've gone as far as we can in terms of discussing it generally. And, and, and again, we'll discuss 270 and 271 in executive session, and we'll read some uh, resolution, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, and uh, we'll give the, the uh, district staff some direction based on that. Uh, Commissioner Shepard. I just got one more thing to say. I just want to say this um, so that everybody can, can hear this. Um, but this is not anything against any of the individuals that did receive raises. This doesn't take away from the work that you've done, that obviously your supervisors felt that you deserved a raise because of the work that they see that you're doing. So I just wanted to make, make that clear that this is all about process and making sure that we're handling our finances correctly. Right. And, and just so that we're clear, I mentioned the example of the board. Um, it wasn't oversight of a policy or anything like that. It was uh, 
our, our salaries are tied to the salaries of uh, city council people. And there was a, a, an understanding or representation, I believe, made from 30 Church Street that their salaries went up and they didn't go up in time and we continue to get that increase. And how it was resolved, for those of you wondering how something like this might, might be resolved, I'm not saying it has to, but we ended up having to give our, the money back and thankfully we were able to do it over a period of time. That's how that worked. I'm not suggesting that that's how this should go down, but, but that is available as an option. All right, so I need a motion, unless there's anything further on those, I need a motion to discuss resolution 249 to 269. It's been moved by Commissioner Hallmark, seconded by uh, Commissioner Funches. Uh, any questions or comments regarding those two res those, uh, those resolutions, 249 to 269? There, there being no further questions or comments, all those in favor of resolution 249 to 269 say aye. 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 Any opposition? Uh, no to 262. Madam Clerk, you recorded that? No? 262. Thank you. I need a motion to discuss additional pay resolutions 272 to 273. So moved. Commissioner Hallmark has moved to discuss those uh, resolutions. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Vice President Powell has seconded. Any questions or comments regarding additional pay resolutions 272 to 273? Uh, yes. Um, yes, ma'am. So for all of these, these, contract, these contractor resolutions, um, I know that we get quarterly reports in regards to um, our, a number of change orders that we receive on a consistent basis. Let her finish. Um, Let, her finish. Let her finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. You finish. Um, but I would like to um, get reports on what the contractors, what schools the contractors have worked in um, at the end of the year and what work did they actually do so that we're tracking um, repairs or any, any work that, that, is, that is put out. I also have a question in regards to some of the contractors having similar work, but it's not specified um, why we're going with two different contractors because we're spending a lot of money. And one of them um, is for boiler repairs, which is resolution 280 and 295. Okay, we're not there just yet. We're at 272 oh. to 273. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. <laughs> Now, your first question, that relate to 272 to 273? No, it didn't. Okay, all right. Uh, um, but I do have a question. We got to go back to two, just really quickly to 255. There are two positions there, but it doesn't state what school these two individuals will be at. Um, I would like to know what schools they're going to be at. It's on page 16. You got that, Barbara? Uh, you, you, you're willing to wait for an answer to that? An executive yeah. session, yeah, can come up today. All right. Uh, presumably, Harry, did you hear that, that question? Did you repeat that, Commissioner LeBron? The, um, on page 16, Harry, and resolution 255, there is a community school site coordinator and an expanded resource learning coordinator. I would like to know what schools those individuals be, be, will be placed at or working out of. There you go. Okay. Number nine and number three. Thank Thank perfect. You. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any further questions with respect to 272 to 273? There being no further questions or comments, all those in favor of additional pay resolutions 272 to 273 say aye. 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 Any opposition? Let's move on to procurement and supply resolution 274. Sir, can I get a motion to discuss resolution 274? So moved. Been moved by Commissioner Hallmark, okay. seconded by Commissioner Funches. Any questions or comments regarding resolution 274? There being no questions or comments, all those in favor of resolution 274 say aye. 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 Any opposition? Now we're moving on to resolutions 275 to 302 educational facilities resolutions. Are there any questions or comments? For, uh, I'm sorry, I need a motion to discuss those resolutions. Motion. And moved by Commissioner uh, LeBron, seconded by Commissioner Funches. Any questions or comments, uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner Shepard? Yeah, so um, again, I would like to um, <laughs> request that we receive reports on what each of our contractors are doing at the end of the year and what schools they were at and what work did they actually do so that we're tracking to make sure that we're not paying for the same services over and over again. I just want to make sure we're keeping an eye on that. And then also I needed um, clarification on resolution 280 and 295 which deal with boiler repairs and why we would go with two different contractors for those. Um, yeah, 280. If it's supposed to be district. Mike, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Hallmark. Uh, 
Come on down. Good evening. Uh, to the first question, certainly by, by contractor, we can certainly provide that level of uh, detail in regards to the amount of work and the timing of it and so forth. And the boiler repairs, depending on the type of boiler we have, that's basically how the contractors are, are, are uh, divided. It's a little bit into the intricacies of it, but that's, uh, we can provide that scope of work as well. And some of these are renewals and some of these are new based upon we discussed with the finance committee. You all set, Commissioner Shepard? Um, yes. Any further questions or comments uh, regarding 275 to 302? There being no further questions or comments, all those in favor of educational facilities resolutions 275 to 302 say aye. 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 Any opposition? And finally, we have other. That's resolutions 303 to 326. I get a motion to discuss those resolutions? The 326? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have some questions. Um, Summit. Oh, oh, uh, oh, hold on, let's, let's uh, do the formalities first. Okay. Summit. Commissioner Hallmark has moved, seconded. Uh, Commissioner Funches. Uh, Commissioner LeBron, you got a question? Yeah, on um, page 64 and 65, resolution 307 and 308. So both of them are the same CBO. But in resolution 308, it talks about not only the number of students, but the school. <coughs> And then in the other resolution, 307, the one prior, it doesn't actually state what school we're paying for. It says 80 students, and it says what grades, but it doesn't say what school. Barbara, do you have anybody who can answer that? Good evening. Good evening. Um, it is school 19 that they will be working with. So on both of them, they're my schools, 17 and 19. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments regarding those resolutions designated as other 303 to 326? Yes, Commissioner Hallmark? Just a thanks. You know, there's, yep, yep, there's two gifts, resolution 324, 325. 324, we want to thank GMR Associates, who's donated $3,000 uh, to school number 33 for fields and purchasing food. Uh, and then 325 is from the Education Market Resources, who have donated $1,000 to purchase classroom supplies uh, for school number 25, and we thank you. Thank you. Um, just one more follow-up. So resolution 323, since I think we're going through all of these right now. Um, the college fair that the city does in collaboration with the city school district, um, there was a request this year to for the district to provide some Title I funding for a parent workshop. And I just wanted to follow up on where the resolution is for that and if that was approved. You know anything about Commissioner Shepard. Um, I know we're in the habit of not answering for the administration, um, but I have requested for the resolution to come forward. Um, and uh, we did, uh, the administration did approve for the, that additional funding of Title I, but there wasn't a resolution that was necessary. So okay. we were able to get that on top of, of what we give in the past. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Commissioner Shepard. Um, any further questions or comments regarding resolutions 303 to 326? We're good? Yep. Uh, all those in favor of resolution 303 to 326 say aye. 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 All right. Um, we are next moving to uh, new business. Uh, Commissioner Funches has summarized these particular uh, policy um, issues. They're all information items. Um, unless there's uh, any further comment, we'll move on to uh, announcing our next board business meeting, which is October the 18th, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. Um, I wasn't able to reach Todd. Yeah, he got it? it? All right, so I need a, uh, a motion to go into executive session motion. to discuss a particular person, employee. That motion has been moved and seconded. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor say aye. aye. And as we conclude uh, this portion of our meeting, uh, we are going to play Andrea, how do you pronounce your first name? Andrea Day's song, Rise. I will rise up. That's appropriate. <laughs> 
All right, for you gladiators out there, we will um, uh, conclude our meeting downstairs on the second floor. Good night, everybody. Have a nice uh, October.